and I had to focus on day four out of the five week program, which was engineering for hazardous weather. And my curriculum was based off wind energy where I used what I learned in MATLAB to talk about how it positively affects our lives. And the importance of this is that wind energy is under STEM and STEM creates the future for our economy because we need it to innovate. And I just thought that this was kind of a good topic to teach students because it's one of the fastest growing sources of renewable energy. And studies show that students from first grade to fourth grade have more receptive brains. And that's specifically why we target them so we could improve or increase STEM education. And as part of the curriculum, I developed a mini game using a website called Scratch. And this is just a visual programming language or block-based language that was developed by the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And this GIF over here is the Scratch interface where that's the block-based code and the outcomes of that, you can see it on the left side based on whatever you're trying to make it do. And the last component was, like I said, the strawberry field projects. We had to build models for a strawberry producer to test wind damage. And the importance of this is Hurricane Irma and Hurricane Michael cost producers in Florida an estimated $180 million. And nobody wants to pay that money because you're trying to gain money, not lose money. And that's one of the importance of assessing um, models before they're actually built. So you could do things like reduce production loss or specifically for this project, improve the behavior of the plant's distribution. So here is a result of Hurricane Emma to a conventional bed and a compact bed. And the black thing on top of it are plastic coverings. And as you can see, compact beds are more structured than conventional beds, and below are just the schematics of both systems for strawberry field models. And here is a boundary layer wind tunnel that I was talking about. So we're entering the control room to the boundary layer wind tunnel, where you're able to test for fluid dynamic data, like how much wind or water pressure a model could withstand. So sorry for anyone that has tried to work, but the grids at the bottom are able to configure natural environments. So you're able to test how a model would behave in like a coastal area, urban area, and a desert. So instrumentation and so these are the software or instruments that I use for all three components of my research. And I'll be going through the methodology of all three of them. So for MATLAB, we developed codes that compared the first and second order statistical moments of wind. The first order is just the mean wind profile and the second order is just the turbulence intensity profile. And the last one is the turbulence intensity of the wind where the machine learning algorithm detected within three standard deviations, um, which experiments were statistically similar or just equivalent to understand the capacity of how the boundary layer wind tunnel I showed you can simulate wind behavior. And then for the 4-H epic weather program, so first we began by having two meetings to plan out the lesson plan. And we created a schedule on Google Docs just so you know everyone has the information and everyone is on the same page. And then I went ahead to create a scratch game to implement on the website that we were building on Google Sites. And this is the last component, which was the shovel planters. So first it was designed in Autodesk Inventor, which is a CAD software, a computer-aided design software. And it was transferred to a GPO file to a CNC routing machine. And CNC just means that um, 
it's a computer controlled machine. So it takes instructions from the computer to function. And it actually cut out what was designed on pieces of polycarbonate. And polycarbonate is just synthetic plastic. And here are some sample outcomes. This is diaphragm pieces. And that was some of the rolls, the strawberry rolls for the fields. And the diaphragm pieces are just for more structural integrity. And you can kind of see them in here. And then this is just us fusing the components and using materials like sandpaper and knives to kind of put them together. And the last step was tubulation, which is the important part where we are able to get pressure measurements. And these things that you see over here were actually meant to be the same size. So you don't get different levels of measurements and get incorrect data. And here are my results. So there are no results from MATLAB because that was just practice for me to better understand how to teach students in the 4A program. And this was the outcome. I don't know if anyone can see this. But, um, Um, So I'm just gonna skim through this for the purpose of time. And our focus was, like I said, day four. And this was the introduction page that was also done with the help of my mentor, um, Dr. Jeremy. And then next we have the wind energy page that I mostly designed where I talked about wind, stem, a wind turbine. And then here was the mini game that was made in scratch. The next was a self-guided lab tour that because the program was virtual, it just gave a chance for students to feel like they're actually there. And the last component was an assessment just to assess their knowledge. And this is an example of the tubulated strawberry fields. And that was an example of one world that was done with tubulation. And here are two other roles that were tubulated. So in general, my MATLAB experience pra practice improved the effectiveness of how I taught K through 12 students. And I realized that building models actually require attention to detail because you don't want to design something wrong, get the wrong data. And when you actually build the structure and it fails, you have to pay more money. And that's what we were actually trying to avoid by testing it in the first place. And adapting to, technolo adapting to technology to harness wind power is actually a complicated process because one, wind is invisible. So in order to test that, you have to assess how it works impacting another object. However, future considerations are to make airborne wind turbines where they use their own aerodynamics to harness the wind's power and artificial wind harvesting trees, which are just fake trees that have spinning leaves. And just for in the conclusion, STEM education is very effective because it increases secondary knowledge dissemination, which is basically me explaining to you and then you want to tell somebody else and the information is just like sharing to everyone. So it's able to increase innovation and provide economic benefits which we need for the future. And like I said, wind energy is an environmentally sustainable source of power and it's able to mitigate problems that we have currently such as global warming. 
And lastly, I'd like to acknowledge my mentors, my graduate mentor, Marielle, and my faculty mentors, Dr. Jeremy and Dr. Curtis for this research. And I also like to thank my other RU students, Tomas and Miguel. Um, lastly, I'd like to thank the University of Florida and the NSF for funding this research. And here are the sources I used for this presentation. Thank you for listening. Does anyone have any questions? Great job, Hillary. Any questions? So hello, everyone. My name is Julia Vizu, and I'm going to be talking about research that I did at the Mobile Shaker site at UT Austin. And the code that I developed for this overall research project on axially loaded flow line tests. Okay, so a little bit of a roadmap. I'm going to first be talking about the concepts and background of the objective of this project. I'm then gonna be getting into the materials and instrumentation used for the experiment that was conducted before I started working on this research project. And then I'm gonna be getting into the materials and instrumentation that I used and then the methodology, the results, and the discussion. So the implications of the results that I obtained. So as many of you may have seen in the news, a gas leak, there was a gas leak in the Gulf of Mexico and it was termed as the eye of fire. And this fire erupted during the summer while I was doing my research on flow lines in offshore environments. And it, reminded me of the importance of this research. And although it may have not been caused by the same reasons that I researched, it had the same consequences. With that said, the research that I worked on focused on flow lines in offshore environments and how to further stabilize them. This was the bigger picture of the project. And so what are flow lines? Flow lines are thin pipelines in, in the seabed of offshore environments that carry hydrocarbon products such as oil. And what happens when these flow lines are not stable is they experience pipeline walking, which I will talk about further in the next few slides. And the, this pipeline walking phenomenon may be caused by disturbances such as hydrodynamic forces, so waves, currents, or also changes in temperature and pressure. And that's gonna be more relevant as climate change persists. And this change in temperature and pressure can cause these flow lines to expand and contract. And these disturbances may cause buckling later on, which can cause events, disastrous events such as um, gas leaks and oil spills, which is what we ultimately, of course, want to avoid. Um, so how can we improve or prevent such disturbances to a flow line pipe design? We can consider the resistance that is experienced at the interface between the pipe and the clay. And the stronger this resistance is, the more reliable the placement of the pipe will be. So if this friction were to be better understood, it could save a lot of time and money. So the overall purpose of this research is to better understand this friction and the effect of cyclic loading on this friction. And cyclic loading in a lab setting is meant to mimic these disturbances that I mentioned before. Um, as for my own purpose, when it comes to my contribution to this project, it's to organize and process the data through Python in order to allow for these bigger questions to be answered. And I'm going to be using um, 
MATLAB code that was previously um, created to kind of convert it to Python. And Python will be useful because there's a lot of data to be worked with and with large file sizes. So the code will be able to be accessed and utilized more efficiently through a faster program such as Python. So a little bit of background on the terms that I used previously. So the issue is pipeline walking, as I mentioned before. And pipeline walking is incremental axial movements of the pipe or displacement of the pipe from the original location. And we want to mitigate this walking phenomenon because it puts the integrity of the structures at risk. So how do we decrease this pipeline walking? There are a few factors we can consider, such as sweeping velocities or um, rates of loading. And this has an impact on the drainage behavior. So it's been found through studies that slow, um, slow sweeping velocities will experience drained behavior while fast loading will experience undrained behavior. And this makes sense because the rate of dissipation of water from the clay or soil cannot keep up with the rate of loading. And when this happens, the pore pressure builds up and the clay remains undrained. And it's important to understand um, drainage behavior and sweeping velocities because the friction at the interface will behave differently depending on the drainage state. Another important term to understand is the residual friction. And this is the point at which the friction reaches a steady value after many cycles of pipeline walking or thermal cycles. And we of course want this value to be as high as possible because that will secure our pipe more in place. So when the interface reaches this residual friction, at this point, the walking rate decreases. And this is our overall goal for the pipe to experience the least amount of displacement. And in a similar study done, um, researchers Smith and White, they were guided by the same assumption that their interface would also reach a residual friction value. And uh, they found that over 30 days of their testing that their residual friction increased by 80%. And so the implications of this is that due to this increased friction, the cost of mitigating axial movement over time won't be so much of an issue. Um, okay, so I'm not now gonna be getting into the materials and instrumentation for um, the model setup. So this is a motor powered simulation that conducted four series of tests and it's a clay bed um, filled with Gulf of Mexico clay and it had polypropylene pipes placed along it that were subjected to axial loading and the displacements were recorded um, using LVDT sensors. And six sensors were placed all along this setup of um, pulleys and a linear actuator that was balanced by a counterweight. So this is the model setup that I used, or that not that I used, but that my mentors used to retrieve the data that I worked with. So what I used is the data obtained from these four series of tests. And I used the Jupyter Notebooks application in the Anaconda software. So the first part of my methodology was to import and read the data. And um, the goal of this was to consolidate the data because there was such an abundant amount of it, to consolidate it, all four series of data into one table where each individual series and test could be loaded and displayed. And the first step of this was to store the location of the files in four separate variables called file lists. 
to then to store them together into an array and um, make arrays for the data frames. And this is the step that enabled the user to load and display any test of their choosing. And the files were then stored in directories that would return the names of the lists. The second part of my methodology was to plot the data. So I plotted for the second test of the second series to demonstrate the usage of the data. Um, and I did this by first importing the matplotlib package and then creating arrays for the sensor data that I was um, interested in. And then I applied the calibration factors and offsets for this sensor data. And this was important to do because the data needed to be smooth, meaning the effects of noise in the sensor data needed to be removed. Because for our case, we wanted to obtain the friction solely at the interface, but the sensors also picked up friction from the pulleys. So we needed to filter the data and isolate the values for our friction of interest. So this is the first part of my results. This is the big table that I obtained to for all four series. And um, this is where the user, for example, here could ask for the first five tests of the third series, and it would load in display. This is the second part of my results. And as shown here on the left, this is the curve that I obtained from um, Python. And on the right is from the original plot on MATLAB. And although they may not look super similar, it is due to differences in scaling and calibration. But nonetheless, the curvature is the same. Um, so conclusion, uh, due to the abundance of data, there needed to be a way to access the data more quickly and efficiently. And the template and framework was created to um, access this data and um, ways that this code can be improved is by actually expanding on the existing code so that the plots of multiple tests could be created simultaneously, which is demonstrated by this plot here that was created through MATLAB before. So that would be the next step of this code is to do this exact step, but through Python. Uh, here are my references. And I, of course, wanted to acknowledge the NSF for funding this natural hazards research. I wanted to thank my mentors, Dr. Clayton and Ahmed for all the guidance. And of course, to Dr. Robin for helping us through every step of the way. And that is my presentation. Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Jonathan McCallie. I'm a third year at the University of Florida, and I had the privilege of working at uh, FIU's Wall of Wind this summer with my graduate mentor, Ali, and my faculty mentor, Dr. Lee, on an investigation into the dynamic effects of wind induced vibrations on certain wall systems. So, I'd like to set a foundation uh, for what I will go over in my model later on and explain some basic curtain wall technology. Um, early in the 20th century is when the rise of modern architecture called for the tearing down of walls and opening up spaces. And of course, the best way to do this is to include more windows. So curtain walls make the entire wall a window, uh, opening up the room, bringing in more light. And the most basic curtain walls at first only had two main components, frames and infill panels. The infill panels do not necessarily have to be glass, depending on the purpose they change, but glass is the most popular. Um, so of course, curtain walls have become very popular in places with beautiful scenery and high rise buildings, uh, elevated surfaces. So um, they tend to be on high rise buildings where they hang on the outside of the floor slabs, unlike normal windows where they're flush. Uh, that's how they get their name to be hanging like a curtain. There's two main ways that they are installed, panelized, so they're installed and connected one by one on site, or they're unitized where they're connected off site and then they're installed together as one. Now, these places where 
they're installed where they have beautiful views, tend to also come with many natural hazards, which present a danger to the curtain walls. Now, the most obvious concerns being airborne debris and other external forces have been accounted for in most standards and codes, uh, yet there are still many damages that occur. Some of the most common types of damage like glass bullets and frame deformation are signs that there may be uh, wind-induced vibrations on the curtain walls that cause a risk to, the, to them. Um, the lack of consideration of the, the resonance effect in the curtain walls is shown in ASC 7 and other codes. And one of the goals of this research is to actually reconsider those codes and to offer alternatives. So, moving forward, the most qualified facility to actually run these hurricane simulations is the FLU Wall of Wind. It has 12 electric fans, uh, each producing 700 horsepower and replicating a category five hurricane. Um, as you can see from the diagram, there's a six by six fan wall, uh, which is directed through a, a wind tunnel that has spires on the floor to mimic the natural turbulence uh, and the atmospheric boundary layer. And the model is constructed on a turntable to easily rotate for different attack angles and they increase the speed as well for different tests. Here's an image of the exterior of the wall wind facility and the back of the fans. There's a person there for side reference if you can see. This is a view from the turntable into the tunnel and a close up of the inside of the tunnel. Now onto the experimental model. Uh, this model is designed, constructed, and assembled by our industry partner, Thomas Alyssa. They're an international curtain wall uh, manufacturer and installer. Part of our designs will help them, part of our tests will help them redesign their curtain walls and to test for any risk analysis. Um, the one that I mainly worked on was a double skin facade, meaning that has two layers. Before I came in to join the team, there was a single skin facade that was tested, which as you can probably guess, only had one layer. Um, this is a list of the components and I will go over the components as I explain how we modeled them in a numerical FEM model on Midas Gem software. Uh, one of the most complicated parts of this was uh, modeling the steel support structure without actually including the steel support structure in the model. So the numerical model development was of course made because the facility has limitations on how many tests they can run due to the costs. Um, this MitoGen software was chosen because it offers structural and finite element analysis functions. Uh, this 3D model is fan based uh, finite element methods and the creation steps start with AutoCAD drawings provided for us by Primus to Alyssa. And each and every section is either modified to more easily extract results or to make it as exact as possible. Um, once the creation is completed, there's a two phase calibration process where we first use an eigen analysis to compare the natural frequency of the software to the experimental model. And we use a dynamic analysis to compare some of the plots that we get to the model making this accurate as possible. Here's an image of the AutoCAD drawings. You see on the right, the front of the two panels. And on the left, you can see how there's two layers, um, the left being the external and the right being the internal. Those yellow ports, parts are the cross sections of the frames that are modeled exactly. And I'll explain the glass modeling in a moment. So the glass modeling first starts with creating nodes in the software. On the right, you can see an image of the panel it is uh, has the coordinates in X and Y for all of the nodes which have pressure taps on them as where data is collected. There's also nodes for the perimeter. Um, we define all the elements based on these nodes and the thickness and cross section of all the components are exact as the AutoCAD calls for it. So more into the, the layering of the panels, the internal layer is a triple glazing unit, which means it has three panels. And each of these panels is separated by a metal spacer. There's a cavity pressure on the inside. The external layer is a single glazing unit. It only has one panel and has a laminated glass plates, meaning that there's two glass plates that are bonded by PVB. It's a polyvinyl butyrol resin. 
Here's a close-up of the CAD drawings. The left is the PVB, the purple connecting the two, and the right is the white metal spacer. For the external panel, the reason why we could not model it exactly as we did with the triple glazing unit is because it, the PVB tends to transfer the shear load. So we had to account for that by actually changing the thickness value and altering the weight density. These two values, these two material properties, go into the calculation of the natural frequency. So adjusting them is important to actually get accurate values on the external panel. So here's an image of how the two panels combined make up the final product. Now for the frame modeling, here's a close-up of the cross sections. These cross sections are broken down into vertical and horizontal. The mullion is the vertical, the transom is the horizontal. Uh, there's nine cross sections. And these are modeled based on the, the yellow portions that you saw in the AutoCAD drawing video. So here's the frames, each of them combined to make the final frame product. Now the spring connections are one of the most tedious parts of this software modeling. Uh, the spring connections are between frames, between panels, and then from frame to panel. Um, there's three main ways that they're modeled. The cavity pressure between the panels, which I explained in the triple glazing unit, that's replicated by transferring the cavity pressure to a spring force. Uh, then there's the inner transom and inner molding connections. So the frames are connected either vertically or horizontally. There's also the silicone gasket joints where the actual panels connect to the frames. So in the cavity pressure springs, we're provided data by Permis to Alyssa on the cavity pressure between the panels. And that's what this plot here shows in the top. There's spring force over displacement. And if you know Hooke's law, you can get the stiffness by using the force over the displacement. So zooming in on the, that red circle, you'll see we can take the slope of that plot and we can get the stiffness values. The stiffness values are later calibrated to make the model more accurate, but this is the starting point. Um, and the image on the left shows you where the pressure is between the panels. And on the right, you can see those colorful X, Y, Z uh, indicators showing where the springs are connected. Now, this is a close-up on the inner mullion interaction and the inner transom where the frames connect. They also connect elsewhere, um, but this is really just to connect the two panels together uh, between the vertical and the horizontal. Zooming in on this, uh, the silicon gasket joints on the left for the AutoCAD, you can see where the panel connects to the transom from the silicon gasket joint. Um, again, the colorful XYZ axis shows this. Moving on to the steel support structure. Now, this, this triple blazing unit is the first connection on the top. As you can see in the image, there's four connections on the top and 20 on the bottom to both frames. It is secured on the steel frame, but we try not to model the steel frame in the clearing wall um, numerical model because it's not a part of the actual uh, current wall. So instead we set a boundary condition also using a different form of springs so that we can um, include the stiffness values from the way that the structure affects the natural frequency, but not actually have to model it. Here's a close-up of the steel frame you can see on the bottom. There's two rails on this left figure that show where the frames connect. In the center, you can see where the top corners connect to the triple glazing unit frame. And then this, the far right image is where it connects in the center of the top. So here's an image. You can see the, the yellow circles are where the boundary conditions uh, are set, the four on the top, the 20 in the bottom. The top ones restrain rotation in all directions. And there's a horizontal restraint on the translation with a partially released vertical translation, uh, leaving gravity to hold it down. Um, as I showed you before, there's the, the glass frames completed, the frames completed, and now when they're connected, you can see the colorful springs completing the model. Now this is some more images of the assembly of the double skin facade. You can see the structure is fastened to the turntable and you can more easily see the two layers to the glass panels. Now, the way that we collected our data was by having a data logging system within the wooden housing. Um, so in the steel structure, there's a data logging system that connects to pressure tabs, accelerometers, and strain gauges. 
The accelerometers and strain gauges are on the front on the curtain wall panels, and those obviously collect acceleration and strain data. Uh, but the pressure tabs are actually connected to the back of polycarbonate panels because those cannot attach to the panel without piercing it. So they must be put in the back to uh, reduce the damage to the curtain wall. So the first phase of the calibration, as I said, was an eigen analysis. Uh, this is some of our preliminary results. We haven't actually gotten the natural frequency matched up yet. But as you can see, the first mode is at 5.3, and we're expecting something like 4.3. So a few more calibrations, and we should be close. Uh, the main purpose of this, other than matching um, the natural frequency values, is to also get some contour maps and see where the deformation and uh, see deformation and the color coding of how the uh, vibrations affect the model. So the red is obviously the more intense, the blue is less intense. And there's actually 10 modes of vibration. I'll go through them now, as you can see. You can also see some concavity in the panels um, as they bend. Now there's supposed to be an animation here, but I'll skip it for the sake of time. And on the right, you can also see those little arrows showing where each of the nodes receives wind loading data. Uh, so there's a dynamic effect that, that would be shown by the animation where the panels basically buckle in the center and they deform. So these are the first plots of the second phase of the calibration, the uh, dynamic analysis. So all four of these plots come from the accelerometers. There's one in the center of each of the panels in the front and one in the center of each of the panels in the back. Um, basically, these plots show us over a 60 second time interval how the, the, the curtain wall dynamically responds to the wind loading. You can notice that the first and second on top are very similar and the, the second, the third and fourth and the bottom are very similar. So the mean acceleration values are also gathered from that 60 second time interval. And um, they're in that table there. You can, you can see from this, uh, how, close, how close we are to the acceleration values that are expected, which is actually supposed to be roughly four for each of them. It's a four times, which means tweaking the springs and tweaking um, the boundary conditions will also bring us closer. So the final plots are the power spectra density curves. Uh, these are used with Fourier transforms in a MATLAB code. And there's two reasons why we use these uh, plots. The first is to see the data in a frequency domain. It's more easy to tell where they spike. Um, you can see they're roughly around four or five hertz in the spikes. Uh, and the second reason is actually to get the area underneath the curve to see how much energy is absorbed in the system, especially under those spikes. Now, because the calibration was not fully completed, once it is, the full scale, the full scale model will actually be completely accurate to the software. Uh, from there, there are parametric studies to prepare for risk assessment analyses. These will produce code uh, probabilistic fragility curves. And they will help Hermosilis actually redesign and maintain the, the already constructed uh, curtain walls. Um, now that the double skin and single now that the double skin and single skin facades have been completed, uh, the investigation will continue into the correlation between water intrusion due to wind-driven rain and the wind-induced vibrations that occur on the panels. Um, the the information that we have gathered already warrants a reconsideration of AC7 since AC7 asks for a one hertz uh, minimum of the natural frequency. And we have found it to be at least four. So these panels will actually help in uh, reconsidering the code, rewriting it, and potentially um, changing the landscape of our construction. 
So of course, I would like to acknowledge uh, my mentors, Dr. Lee and Ali, for guiding me through the research process. I'd like to thank Nahiri, uh, the RU experience, and Dr. Nelson for everything she's done for us. And then, you know, shout out to NSF. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah. 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 I didn't. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He asked if I had a numerical methods class before learning about uh, the eigen analysis, and I did. So. A lot of it was on the go, right? Um, really, anything that leads to wind, uh, to water intrusion, or any deformation that we cause the fan to. You know, shut. Most of these cases, it's actually like total destruction, and it's not it's minor, unless there's like operable windows or like attachments on the outside. Um, but yeah, it's really just anything that like, you know weakens the system. Um, well, just different test cases will have different wind speeds and attack angles, so each of them will give off different eigen. Um, eigenvalues and different modes of vibration. Oh, and can you establish <laughs> a failure point for the system? So that was the other question. Did you establish a failure point for the system? Hello, my name is Zane Schemmer. I'm a structural engineering student at the University of California at Berkeley. This past summer, I was in Park City, Utah, where I was working remotely at the Neary RU site at the University of California, San Diego. This site is home to a large high-performance outdoor shape table, which is currently being upgraded to six degrees of freedom. For my summer project, I was assigned to work on the modular test bed building, or MTB squared. This, is to this project aims to test three types of different buildings, all of which have modular framing systems. In addition, we aim to verify computer algorithms for structural behavior predictions and create new identification algorithms based on experimental data. Now these three designs I mentioned. So the first one is a special moment frame, which you see to the left of your screen. It has no bracing systems, um, which pretty much means it has to resist lateral movement at the connections that you see. The second one is BRB1, which stands for Buckling Reinforced Bracing System. And that pretty much has uh, lateral restraints in the longitudinal direction that go diagonal. And then the third one is a combination of the two, where the first story is just the moment frames. And what you can see here too, is that the first direction in the longitudinal way has 16 foot bays. In the transverse direction, it's a 20 foot bay. And it's three stories tall with each story measuring 12 feet high. This is designed to be a shared use facility which will be reconfigurable for future people to test across the country. And a key word with the structure too is resilience. MTB squared is supposed to be pretty much reconfigurable and totally reusable. The framing, decking, and non-structural systems can all be changed to accommodate any research needs. For this project, we use steel decking plates in all the corners and fiber reinforced concrete in the center stones. Okay, so let's provide some background. Earthquake resistant design has seen a lot of changes in the years. At first, you had engineers kind of start out and say, we need to build things stronger. It really needs to resist the lateral movement. And you had other people say, no, no, no. Let's make it duck flow. It's got to flow more, it flows more. And so that is great, but it presents some issues because it performs well in small to medium sized earthquakes. But when you start to get medium to large, that brittle structure or that ductile structure it's either going to split and create catastrophic failure or vibrate too much and create catastrophic failure. So how do we address this? How do we get safety and still prevent structural failure? Well, in the words of the great Hannah Montana, we want the best of both worlds. And capacity design methods brings both of these into play. We want more predictable forms of energy dissipation. And how we create that is by mixing both ductile and brittle structures in one. And so what you have is a brittle system in this example to the outside and a ductile system in the center. And what happens is in large earthquakes, the ductile system is designed to fail or yield and pretty much keep the structure intact, but not collapse. The issues with this though, 
is that this middle system in this example would have to be entirely replaced. And if this isn't feasible, it results in the demolition and reconstruction, which is very costly. So let's change gears a little bit and talk about modular construction. This is a new thing that's kind of hitting the world and it's becoming pretty popular. And the reasons are primarily economic. Because you have fabrication take place before site, you're able to have less labor costs and less machine rental costs when you're during construction. How it's applicable to this project is that you're able to easily interchange parts, which kind of presents a solution uh, to design capacity methods. Basically, if we're able to take, if we go back to the last slide and remember this yielding picture, if we're able to take the center span, which is yielding, and we're able to just interchange these parts really easily without having to totally deconstruct or kind of go in and fix things individually, then this could be a super easy switch. Now, this is only possible if we go back to the building design phase and we really think out the connection scheme beforehand. And so the two key connections that we're using with MTB squared are Durafuse plates and BRB energy, BR, buckling reinforced bracing systems, or BRBs for short. And both of these prevent big structural damage and absorb energy a lot better than previous structures. So my work for the summer began with designing the project website. This was really good learning experience for me because this project has been a couple years in the making. So doing this caught me up to date on all the partners that we're working with through industry and government, and also kind of taught me about who my faculty mentors I was working with, who my PhD mentors, and just a lot of the background about this project. Um, I'd never worked with HTML before, so this was my first time. And as you can see, the website looks a little bit retro with kind of a mid 2000s vibe, um, but I'm still very proud of it. In addition, what I thought was very key to me this summer was getting to go into the structures lab at the University of Utah. Prior to going into the lab, a lot of the geometries of the members and both the connections were very vague and a little bit disorienting to me um, based on the structural drawings that were in 2D. But getting to go into the lab and interact with these things in person gave me a very tangible feel for all these materials, all the connections, and how they would be instrumented for the testing phase. Um, and so the physical materials we used for the columns were W12 by 36 shape, um, beams and girders were sides of W14 by 34, and then all plates were ASTM grade A57250, um, and the standard Durafuse shear plates were used for the special moment framing systems, and the BRBs had an outer shape of HSS 8 by 8 by 40. And the software used for this project was Visual Code Studio, uh, which is just a default Mac package for kind of doing code things. I used that for the HTML portion. Um, I also used AutoCAD to generate renderings of the 3D drawings for the buildings. And I used Jupyter Notebook uh, to kind of create some predictive algorithms for the experiments at the end. And so another key part was the instrumentation, which I vaguely touched on earlier. Um, and the key components that we had were accelerometers. Accelerometers were going to be placed on every level to measure obviously acceleration in three directions um, for the building. Then we also use strain gauges, which were placed at critical locations on the shear plates and the BRBs. And then we had linear variable differential transformers or LVDTs, which were placed on both ends of the buckling BRBs to pretty much measure kind of what they were doing, the deflection shape. Um, and then we had string plots, which were placed at off table safety towers to kind of measure the drift of the building during testing. So I started to kind of get more of a clear um, image of the rest of my tasks for the summer. And so the first step right here, as you can see, were these AutoCAD drawings. Um, and the far left is what the shop drawings from SME look like. And this is where I was kind of looking at things saying this is a little confusing to me. Um, but after going into the UV lab, I decided to kind of take things step by step. The first thing I did was pretty much looked at all the individual member breakouts. And I drew them out one by one, which created a layers list that you can see is about 44, 45 members. And these are all grouped together. I was able to rearrange them in 3D and kind of construct the building as you would almost in real life and uh, create the 3D rendering for AutoCAD. Um, and so here you can see more detailed views of the three building configuration I talked about. And this first one, we're looking at the SMF here. And what the key component of this building is, it's the Durafuse plates. And right underneath, if you look at the bottom one, um, it kind of has an oval shaped elongation. 
And what this is meant for is kind of for that yielding that we talked about earlier. We're going to try and target the yields that are right there. Uh, so it doesn't happen in the beam. It doesn't happen in the column. It happens at this plate location, right where we want it. And we're able to just take that plate out by unfolding it, replace it with a new one, and we're all set up and ready to go. And here's the same thing for the BRBs. But you can see everything's the same here, um, except we take out those Durafuse plates, we put in some gossets, and then we're able to connect the BRBs to the system and have it be pretty much the same. Um, and then here is BRB2, which, like I said before, was a combination of both. And that's why you can see this uh, image to the right here. You got the gossip plate and the BRB connecting up to the top, and then you have the Durafuse plate underneath the beam. And what we started to realize as we're getting further into this process is that when the testing is going to be taking place during the fall, we likely will not have enough construction time to be able to reconfigure MTB squared to test all three configurations. Um, and because this is kind of the combination of the two, we decided this one's probably going to be axed. And then this is a drawing of the safety tower. Um, and the safety towers we're going to draw out primarily for the instrumentation plan. And because Putting this into the 3D model too gives us a very good understanding because it's going to be a three-story building with hundreds of instruments. How are we going to arrange all these instruments? How are we going to develop a nomenclature to be able to name, identify, collect and gather data from them, and then implement it into the computer? And so the next thing I did was I did structural calculations to kind of verify what the computer predictions were. Right here, we're starting out with the equivalent lateral force procedure, which if you break out ASC E716, you can pretty much follow step-by-step -step code base just like I did. The first thing we're doing is we're gonna plug in the location of this building uh, to OSHPD, which is a website which tells you a lot of seismic categorization stuff for different things. Um, pretty much just how the building is shape. And so from that, you get a design response spectrum, which you can see in the bottom right corner of the screen. And after that, you can use that to pretty much go through the equivalent lateral force procedure, um, which I do right here, pretty much designing, pretty much figuring out how much is building weigh, how much is it going to shake, and what are the force going to be applied. And then you can go through and break that down level by level. The next thing I did was the modal analysis hand calculations to kind of verify the vibration and the um, dynamic response of the building. And this sets up very nicely as an eigenvalue problem because every building, you got a stiffness and you got a mass. And you can pretty much isolate and you can solve for the frequency uh, by doing pretty much an eigenvalue function in that lab. And that yields kind of your general mode shapes and your frequencies. Okay, some of these numbers got a little interesting when I export it, I guess. Um, but what you can see here is pretty much the general shapes of BRB1. Um, in the first mode, it's kind of similar, just going and swaying off to the right. In the second mode, as pretty much when the frequency um, increases, so how many times could be rotating back and forth, all of a sudden you're going to get different mode shapes where it's bending in different directions. And then as you get to the third mode, that's going to be the most um, like windy in a sense. And what you can see here that's kind of interesting, um, it's very similar shapes for the SNF. But what happens is it gets a little bit more exaggerated. And the reason for that is because the SMF, it doesn't have those braces, those resisting um, the lateral motion at the ends. It's going to be a little bit more flexible. And so that's why you get more exaggerated shapes uh, and slightly different period results. And then this is pretty much, so those are both for the longitudinal direction, that two base span. And then this graph is kind of depicting what it looks like for that one base span. Um, and what I think is very interesting is because both masses are pretty similar. Um, the SMF is a little bit lighter because those buckling strain braces are pretty heavy, like about 1,000 pounds each. But for the total weight of the building, it's about 220,000 pounds. Um, you don't see too much of a differentiation uh, between the modal response spectrum for these two sides because they have smaller buckling strain braces on both sides and they look exactly the same. Um, and then the final thing I worked on and we're starting to work on now, it's still in the process, is Python identification algorithms. And the reason we're doing this is to identify those frequencies and mode shapes that I talked about before from experimental data. There's really good ways to kind of get a rough idea for this through computer predictions, but we want to see if we can develop better ways to get it from experimental data to get more accurate results and a better idea of how we can build better earthquake resistant structures in the future. So yeah, 
the preliminary results were that the hand calculations did a good job of verifying the computer models. And then the next steps are to finish the instrumentation nomenclature and identification algorithms, and then collect the structure and experimental data. Construct the structure and collect experimental data. So, um, and here are my acknowledgments. I'd like to thank the NSF for funding this project. My PhD mentor, Mike, for always being there whenever I had any questions. Dr. Tara Hutchinson and Dr. Gilberto Mosqueda for pretty much providing me with so many resources and so much information about earthquake resistant design through this whole experience. I'd also like to thank uh, Dr. Chris Pantelidis and Virginia Liu for inviting me into the Structures Lab at the University of Utah this summer. And then Lewis Lynn for always kind of looking over my calculations and double checking things. And Dr. Robin Nelson for coordinating the whole REU summer program. Um, here's my references, and I will open the floor to any questions at this time. All righty, thank you so much. <laughs> Um, hello everyone, my name is Alex Sassenti. Um, I'm a rising senior at Oregon State University. I'm studying architectural engineering and mathematics. And um, for this summer's Missouri RU program, uh, my project is looking at uh, parametric studies before seismic risk of tall and slender vertical pressure vessels. I worked under the mentorship of Dr. Lude Pimpoli and Dr. Carl Hutchinson at the uh, University of California, San Diego, um, and their large high performance outdoor ship paper. So to begin with a quick introduction. Um, so we're looking at these things called pressure vessels and what exactly are they? They're basically enclosed containers. Uh, they're used to hold liquids, vapors, gases at significantly higher uh, or lower pressures than that of ambient pressure. Um, and we're also looking at storage facilities. Um, they're systems with basically two main components. It's the pressure vessel and the piping that I have labeled there. Um, and these pressure vessels and their piping, uh, they're important and critical elements in the natural gas industry. Um, specifically looking at California's uh, natural uh, gas usage. Um, so natural gas actually makes up about 50% uh, of California's total energy usage. So imagine if an earthquake were to hit um, like these storage facilities, it have pretty, um, uh, it would have pretty uh, significant damages. Um, so that's why we're studying these, but there's been minimal research actually done um, on their uh, seismic effects. So these pressure vessels have to be able to be designed um, and to minimize any prob uh, probability of damage against any earth sort of earthquake or related occurrence. Um, so I'll talk briefly about natural modes. Um, Zane mentioned a little bit before about some natural mode stuff, so I'll be pretty brief about this. But essentially when any sort of dynamic force like a seismic force um, is applied to a building, it's gonna vibrate. So we can see here at the GIF of uh, figure five, we can see um, everyday objects just vibrating. Um, and we can look at, so any, all physical structures have what we call natural frequencies, which are pretty much rates of vibration. Um, and we can look at periods and frequencies and they're inversely proportional with each other. Uh, and so associated with natural frequency, we have what's called uh, the shape of the building, which is the natural mode. So you can see here, uh, figure three, this is like an example of a two-story building um, with the first three natural modes. And then figure four below, we can see that the natural modes are like a cantilever beam or simply supported beam. Um, it's important to analyze um, uh, natural modes and natural frequencies in terms of uh, analyzing earthquake effects. And so I'll talk a little bit about my project scope. So essentially, uh, my project looked at uh, studying the main features of these still vertical pressure vessels and their variability. I developed some flight models using OpenC software, which is pretty much a finite element um, analysis software. It studies, uh, it simulates the structural response of your systems. And eventually we'll head towards running earthquake simulations to develop a fragility curves. And we can look at here, this is kind of a broad picture of the storage facility and the vulnerable elements. Again, what, once we're, uh, what we're looking at is the tall vessels and the painting. So this is a quick flowchart just showing the uh, project process. So the first main part of my project involved uh, developing a parametric matrix, which pretty much I spent about the first three weeks of my internship uh, determining uh, applicable structural vertical pressure vessel parameters that I would need to use for the modeling. And then I had to pretty much look all over the internet to find acceptable uh, vessel values and their ranges. Uh, this in information that I found out is not readily available on the internet. So I had to consult uh, different ASME uh, pressure vessel design codes, uh, pressure vessel design manuals, uh, and different handbooks. 
And then next, I modeled the vessel first as just a cantilever beam, which pretty much just had the uh, pressure vessel with a fixed end at the base. So without the piping, we ran that and just verified it with some hand calculations just to see if everything made sense. And then we decided on some uh, baseline vessel and pipeline configuration that we would actually use for analysis and study. And the green bubbles there is what we're currently working on, working towards. Um, so we're going to be uh, wrapping up the parametric study. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. We're going to be using um, Abacus software and University of Nevada Reno testing for validation. And then we'll eventually head towards developing those fragility curves, aside on some limit states, um, and running earthquake simulations. So first, like I talked about before, uh, the parametric matrix, basically I went uh, to about the first three weeks of internship and looked at what sort of uh, features are important structurally for these vessels and what, we, what would we have to look at in our model. And so some of the relevant ones that we eventually decided on um, involved the vessel outside diameter, the vessel wall thickness, the piping outside diameter, the piping wall thickness, and then the valve there attached to the piping uh, it's a relief valve, so it pretty much just helps regulate pressure. Um, and then where the valve is placed uh, height-wise, and then uh, we fixed the vessel height and we ran the model. So we fixed it at 50 feet, and then we also uh, altered base support as well. Oh, and then one thing to know also with the parameters we're changing, um, basically when I go through and change each parameter, I don't have to change the geometry at all. So these are considered non-node location dependent parameters. It makes it easier for me when I'm running the models. I don't have to change the full geometry. I can just change a quick number and then get the results. So these are the um, values we decided on for each parameter. Um, basically from the research I conducted before, um, these are basically what I found to be mean or average values. And I have some details there outlining like why I chose those values or what, if they were based on calculations or what I found. So initially we started out with some more complex schematics and complex geometries. Um, and it's important to note that these pressure vessels and their piping configurations vary drastically, like there isn't one set um, geometry or configuration. Um, and so we decided to go with a more uh, simple model or simple geometry. So we have um, on the left, you can see, so the pink is the vessel tank going up. And then there's a little bit of piping coming up from the head and then going vertically, or sorry, horizontally, and then going back down vertically. And we have the valve mass there. And then the, the base of the vessel and then the base of the piping are both fixed ends. And so from uh, some assumptions when we're modeling, so we're assuming that the pressure vessels are perfect cylinders. In real life, as we saw before with some of those earlier photos, they actually have ellipsoidal heads, but it's just made it too complicated for modeling. So we're just assuming they're perfect cylinders. Uh, we're also assuming that if a vessel has a skirt base, it's a perfectly fixed base. Uh, in real life, this definitely isn't perfectly uh, fixed. Um, and then when we, <clears throat> when we eventually model other support systems like legs, these are considered weaker base support, which pretty much means it'll have a percentage of the strength of the uh, fixed support. We're also not accounting for any sort of mass inside the vessel. And we're also um, assuming that the piping has the fixed end like I showed before. Um, we'll eventually move towards modeling it with a spring to allow for more rotation. So I ran the model the first time. Uh, this is the open seas eigen analysis outputs, uh, the natural frequencies and the periods. I ran for the first three natural modes in the X and Y directions. Um, X in this case, in this case, mean horizontal direction, and then the Y is the vertical direction. Um, one thing to note in particular with these outputs is that the mode one period in the X direction was pretty high when we ran it. We went back, um, we checked with some hand calculations and some abacus modeling, and it turned out to be right mathematically, but it's still pretty high value, so we're just keeping that on our radar. So I plotted the natural modes, and uh, back from my earlier slides when I was kind of talking about uh, natural modes, these are pretty similar to what we were expecting uh, shape-wise. So these make sense overall. Um, you can see basically most of the movement and the deformation is coming from the piping. So the left segments here um, are pretty much all piping. So that's where most of the movement's coming from. You can also see starting with mode two, there's this uh, top part of the piping here that's also starting to move as well. So the next big part of my project involved conducting a parametric study. So basically those defined parameters that I talked about before, uh, we use those, we change those and analyze the changes in natural frequencies in the horizontal direction. And to come up with a range of values, we use log normal distributions. Uh, log normal meaning it's just a continuous 
uh, audibility distribution. It has a mean and standard deviation, which we decided using engineering judgment. Um, it was all pretty much just like looking at the shape and saying, okay, that looks good enough. So we'll just run with it. Um, so this is just an example of one of the distribution curves we use. This was for vessel diameter. So the first plot we got, um, we plotted the change in natural frequencies for the pipe outside diameter. So a few things to note here is that, so that red curve is um, the mode one. So if we remember back, um, mode one pretty much only involved that um, uh, pipe deformation. So only like the leftmost uh, vertical element of the model. Um, and so it makes sense that basically mode one has the most natural frequency change um, overall. I mean, you definitely can see that mode three is actually a little bit higher when you increase the diameter and mode two is a little bit higher too, like overall when you decrease it. But overall mode one, it makes sense um, since this is basically a mode that only affects the pipe movement. And so if we're changing pipe diameter, it would make sense to see the most change there in natural frequency. And then this parameter actually had the most change overall in natural frequency too. Um, you can see from the graph, it had upwards of almost 70 to 80% absolute natural frequency change amongst, um, I actually plotted amongst uh, 10 nodes. And so uh, the next parameter we looked at was vessel outside diameter. Um, so as you increase the vessel diameter, mode three ended up being having the most natural frequency change overall. And then as you decreased it, mode two had the absolute most um, natural frequency change. Um, and so this also makes sense too, in terms of since modes two and three start to see or have that um, vessel movement contribution. So it would make sense if you change the vessel diameter, we would see movement from the vessel. Um, and then this parameter had upwards of almost 50% absolute natural frequency change amongst uh, the 10 nodes that I had plotted originally. And then the last one we'll look at is valve mass. Um, so this is the valve that's attached to the piping. Uh, we saw very little change overall in natural frequency. You can see it only gets up to like almost five or 6% change in natural frequency overall. Um, and then there's most change in modes two to three, which I found pretty interesting since the valve is attached to the piping, there's more movement coming from, um, or there's more natural frequency change coming from modes two and three, which start to affect the vessel as well. And so lastly, um, with our research, we'll pretty much wrap up this parametric study. Uh, we'll keep interpreting results, but our next big target is what we wanna do is start running those earthquake simulations, um, developing fragility curves and analyzing extent of damage for defined limit states. So to give you an example of what a fragility curve looks like, this is um, on the right here. We have um, one of the papers I read, um, basically they were looking at, um, so the limit states that they had defined for that involved um, leakage. So absolute failure would be reached if the vessel started leaking completely. And they also looked at uh, the limit states in terms of rotational capacity. So when the pipe reached a certain um, rotational state, that would also be considered failure. And so just acknowledgements, I'd like to thank my mentors, Dr. Lady Pantoli and Dr. Todd Hutchinson for all their like wonderful support, guidance, and mentorship for throughout the program. I'd like to thank Dr. Robin Nelson for coordinating the program and always providing support. And I'd also like to thank the National Science Foundation for uh, providing the awards to fund the research. These are my references. Um, are there any questions? Okay, cool. Thank you for listening. <laughs> Okay, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Tyler and my research is merging 360 degree street view images and LIDAR, uh, a usable data product for future analysis. So what is LIDAR? LIDAR stands for light detection and arranging. Uh, so what the scanner does is it fires a laser pulse until it gets a return off an object and it reads that return and it computes the distance with the speed of light times the change in the time divided by two. And so the shortcoming of LIDAR data is it does not provide uh, colorized RGB values to the points by itself. It just gets the return and puts it into a point in space. And it fires millions of these points every minute. And so you get a point cloud of the entire area. Structure from motion does a similar thing, but it uses conventional imagery. It uh, you take a bunch of pictures with different origin points and the programming will match the key points in those pictures to geolocate them so that you get a similar model. The advantage to this is that you don't need any other equipment 
um, you can just use a conventional camera and it will colorize the values automatically. So my research question is, can mobile LIDAR point clouds be colorized with structure from motion point clouds as a usable data product with the hardware and software that's already at the rapid facility? So my job was to devise a workflow to colorize these LIDAR point clouds. Uh, colorized LIDAR point clouds are important because you can differentiate features such as vegetation, buildings, road surfaces, that kind of thing. And you can classify objects as well, such as street signs. So a little bit of background on laser scanning. There's four types of scanning. There's terrestrial, mobile, unmanned, and aerial. Terrestrial is going to be the most precise and the highest density point cloud. And what I mean by highest density point cloud is that the points are much closer together than you would get, for example, with aerial laser scanning where they could be centimeters or tens of centimeters apart. Um, the shortcoming of terrestrial laser scanning is that it's on a tripod and it's stationary. So you would have to move the tripod to get multiple scans. Um, so in comes uh, mobile laser scanning. The advantage of that is it covers a large area. The density is a little bit less than terrestrial laser scanning and it's vehicle mounted. You can either mount it on a vehicle or a backpack. You can ride a bike with it or you can put it on a boat if you wanted to. Then there's unmanned laser scanning which is very widely popular in the last 10 years. It covers a medium area with a similar density to mobile laser scanning, and it is drone mounted. And then the last um, laser scanning is aerial, which is mounted to a, a fixed wing or a helicopter, and it covers the largest area, but has the lowest density. Okay, so the literature. Custom mobile mapping systems do exist but they use specific hardware or software and um, configurations that are not available at the rapid facility. There's also all-in-one configurations sold by third parties that can cost tens of thousands of dollars uh, or hundreds of thousands of dollars, depending on the package. So this research seeks to find a middle ground between the two and use the hardware and software that's already at the rapid facility. Okay, this is my instrumentation. So on the left, we have the Phoenix LiDAR Systems Mini Ranger, which is the LiDAR scanner platform. The white dome on the top is the GPS receiver. Behind this camera, which is not pictured, is the IMU, which is a inertial, inertial measurement unit, um, which is basically a much more precise accelerometer. And then the middle box is the CPU and uh, Phoenix LiDAR Systems proprietary software. And then under the black cover is the scanner itself. The 360 degree cameras on the right are the NC Tech iStar Pulsar. Um, it has one less panoramic camera than the Applied Street View, and it's much smaller. It's a little bit simpler to use. And then the Applied Street View is mounted on the car, and it's a little bit larger. So for the data collection, this is our vehicle that we use to collect the data. The placement of the equipment is very important. So the applied street view camera is placed uh, perpendicular to the ground surface so that you can receive level images while you're taking data. And the mini ranger uh, laser scanner is mounted as far to the rear of the vehicle as possible so that you can avoid taking uh, data of the vehicle itself. And uh, it's a little hard to see in this picture, but that is the laser scanner itself without the cover. Okay, data processing. So for the, la for the LiDAR data, uh, Spatial Explorer was used, which is proprietary software with Phoenix LiDAR systems. The processing was very quick. It took about half an hour to do. Um, there weren't very many complications. It was mostly just plugging the data in and letting the, letting the software run. And then the structure for motion data, which was taken with the Applied Street View, was processed in PIX4D Mapper. And the processing time is more rigorous for PIX4D Mapper because there's a lot of different settings that you are able to edit. And um, it'll take hours to process. And if you get a setting or two wrong, you'll have to process it again, which will also take multiple hours. So that is much longer than spatial tour. 
Okay, now to the colorization. So I use Cloud Compare, which is an open source software developed uh, five to 10 years ago. And I input both of the point clouds into Cloud Compare, and they do not come aligned to start with because the geolocation data with the uh, structure from motion data is not as precise as the LIDAR data. So some alignment needs to occur. So you can see in this top right image that the point clouds are not aligned because this red line you see here is not aligned with this white line. And then in the bottom right image, you can see that the point clouds are aligned because the blue matches up with the white. Cloud Compare has a feature called interpolate from another entity. What that does is the non-color points look for the closest color point and assigns that value to the non-color point. Okay, so this is the structure from motion point cloud. Uh, after it is processed, you can see that there's a lot of holes in the data, particularly this face of the building is not covered. That is because structure from motion data cannot see past vegetation because it is only seeing the surface level, whereas LIDAR data can see past vegetation because it can get multiple returns with the same laser pulse. And then this is the alignment of the point clouds in an isometric view. You can see that the white LIDAR data uh, covers a little bit more area than the structure for motion data. Okay, this is the colorized point cloud of the LIDAR data only. And so you can see from this isometric view that it looks similar to the structure for motion data. So largely it was a success. However, there are some parts that were not collected with structure from motion, and you can see that by the area I'm circling with the laser pointer. This area, um, I think that it takes the closest point that uh, from the structure from motion data and attempts to put that onto those um, areas that did not have data that was collected. And so you get these big blocks of color that don't make sense. And then there are some areas you can see it, it looks kind of like marbling, I would say, where it tries to take uh, multiple different points and it, it doesn't make all one solid color. So it does a bunch of different colors, but you can still tell in this bottom right image, you can still tell features from each other. So I would say that this is useful because you can still tell the trees and the building surfaces and, and the road surface from each other. Uh, this is the comparison between non-colorized and colorized point clouds. And so this leftmost picture is just an intensity uh, graph, basically, of the point cloud. And as you can tell, it's very difficult to see what is going on. Even when you move the model around and look at different parts, it's, it's hard to see which points are which. And so for researchers, colorized data is very important. There were a lot of challenges with this research. Uh, for example, the applied street view processing uh, was not a success, unfortunately, because the applied street view um, camera itself is a fairly small um, platform. It doesn't have a lot of uh, models that are sold. So the support for them on third-party software such as Pix4D Mapper is minimal. Um, for example, there wasn't a calibration profile in PIX40 Mapper, which there usually is for most cameras. Um, so that calibration profile had to be made. Um, geolocation was an issue. So in this bottom left image, you can see these green lines. That is the location error between the GPS data of the Applied Street View and where PIX4D thinks the images are. And so that in the combination of the automatic tie point problems led to the data not being uh, satisfactory. And so these automatic tie points, they are a point in space in multiple images that the program thinks are common. And so a problem with that for uh, terrestrial images is that it thinks that clouds in the sky, um, lines on the car, traffic that's following you for multiple images, it thinks that those are all automatic tie points. And unfortunately in Pix4D Mapper, which is one of the few softwares we were able to use, 
um, you're not able to delete those automatic tie points, you can only mask them. And when those tie points were masked, we still did not get a satisfactory result. Another challenge is that the Mini Ranger needs to be mounted further rearward or on a different vehicle entirely because the Toyota Prius, we couldn't mount it far enough to the rear to uh, capture the data behind the car. And so you can see that in this image here, there is a swath of data directly behind the car on the road surface that was not taken. Uh, another challenge, which we didn't encounter, but I foresee it being a big problem if you're going to do large data sets, is the speed and the traffic. So the Mini Ranger LiDAR scanner can only go up to 22 miles per hour before the density starts degrading to a point that is not satisfactory. And so driving 22 miles an hour on the highway probably isn't a great uh, idea because there's safety concerns and you don't want to uh, cause even more traffic in high traffic areas. So a solution to that may be taking the LiDAR data at night because LiDAR does not need daytime to collect the data. You can take it at any time as long as there's not rain. Uh, and then taking the structure from motion conventional imagery data during the daytime. So colorized uh, unmanned laser scanning point clouds are widely used. It's extremely popular, especially since uh, Drones were widely used and uh, okayed by the FAA. And colorized mobile laser scanning point clouds have proven to be a viable data product in the natural hazards arena, even though it is not as popular. I learned that the NC Tech is definitely going to be the preferred 360 degree camera to colorize these point clouds because of the challenges that I mentioned with the applied street view. The Mini Ranger location data is precise to one centimeter but the structure from motion platforms are less precise in their uh, GPS data. So the benefit to the LiDAR data is if you want to geolocate a data set to a precise area, um, it would be better than structure from motion. In my opinion, structure from motion would be better if you're just looking to make a 3D model with arbitrary coordinates. Um, as you can see in the pictures, there were holes in the data sets, even with the LiDAR data, unfortunately. And I think this could be remedied with multiple passes and passes in opposite directions. In the future, I would like to see concurrent data collection with the NC Tech 360 camera and the LiDAR scanner on the same vehicle, which we unfortunately weren't able to do because of time constraints. And then I would also like to see non-concurrent data collection, as I mentioned before, and also including small drones um, instead of the 360 imagery to capture those structure from motion point clouds and hopefully close more of those holes in the data. Uh, without funding from the National Science Foundation, this research wouldn't be possible. So I, I thank them for their funding and their contributions. And uh, many thanks to Dr. Michael Grillo and Andrew Lida at the University of Washington Rapid Facility. Uh, they've provided mentorship and advice throughout this project that is extremely valuable. And I also thank fellow REU Kaylee Mattingly, whose assistance has proven invaluable because I use some of her data collection for my project. These are my references. Um, feel free to look them up on DesignSafe when I upload them. Is there any questions? The question is, about the automatic tie points and whether you can add manual tie points as well to assist the data. And so with the applied street view, you could add manual tie points, but unfortunately the geolocation issues were such a big problem that the, the program doesn't know where the images are. So the points come out all messed up. And so it's, it's not a satisfactory result. However, with the NC Tech, um, the manual tie points, like you mentioned, work perfectly. Um, the NC Tech camera is calibrated within Pix4D, um, which the applied street view is not. And so that may have been some of the problems. I think if there were less time constraints on my research, I probably could have figured it out or someone in the future can figure out how to use the applied street view. But I think it's very rigorous for the purpose of the rapid facility to process that data. Because the NC Tech, we have the, we have the workflow down for it. So it'll just take you enter the settings, uh, you process it for a couple hours and it's done. For the applied street view, it, it could take days to process, which is not satisfactory. 
Yeah, of course. Thank you for being here today. Uh, I'm going to be presenting the research project that I've been working on over the summer uh, entitled High Resolution Near Surface Soil Model Developed for Site Response Analysis in Alameda, California. The authors on this project are myself, as well as Dr. Adam Zarnowski and Professor Pedro Arduino. The work was completed at the uh, University of Berkeley Center. So, first, I'm going to be going through an introduction, then, talk about the data sets used go into uh, the methodology that was used uh, then into our results, uh, followed by a uh, discussion and the few concluding remarks. So first, to understand the motivations behind this project, uh, the motivation was really to improve our understanding of uh, earthquake-induced uh, site response um, during seismic events. And so some of the main hazards that occur during earthquakes include ground shaking and liquefaction hazards. And they can have highly detrimental consequences on the built environment. So essentially what uh, earthquake induced liquefaction is, uh, is a phenomenon that occurs in saturated loose sandy soils and uh, causes the, the, the soil to lose its strength and react essentially as a liquid. Uh, we also know that ground shaking is significantly amplified um, when uh, passing through soft soil. So there have been many major earthquakes in the San Francisco Bay Area. To name a few, there's the 1906 San Francisco earthquake it had a magnitude of 7.9. Uh, there's also the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake, which both images are shown here with the image on uh, the left showing um, damage issued from this interaction. And more recently, the 2014 South Napa earthquake. So uh, the, many studies show that understanding the near surface soil properties allows us to more accurately predict um, one, the amplification of ground shaking in soil, while also improving our predictions of liquefaction potential and ground deformation that could lead from vertical settlement or lateral spreading. Uh, Huang et al. in particular showed that topographic amplification predictions were, were further improved when incorporating a, detail, a detailed subsurface model. Uh, an important parameter when trying to estimate site response and the effects of an earthquake on the built environment is DS30, which is essentially the time average 30 meter depth shear wave velocity. It is a metric that describes the soil stiffness, and it's an important parameter widely used for site response and damage and loss estimation. It can be calculated with in situ tests such as seismic pump penetration tests, SCPTs, but can also be estimated using topographic based relationships. And uh, so Huang et al, Li et al, Li Tsai, Foster, all developed DS30 maps for Hong Kong, Suzu, Taiwan, New Zealand, respectively. And Thompson et al also developed a DS30 map for uh, California in particular. So it's definitely a widely used metric and more and more researchers are looking into uh, accurately predicting DS30 for uh, site response estimations. So the objective of this project was to develop a high resolution probabilistic soil model for Alameda. Uh, using SCPT data as well as local geotechnical reports that were obtained. The location of uh, Alameda within the San Francisco Bay Area is shown in the top right corner, as well as the, the points of the data sets used as via CPT or Bore or, or shown in the center. So the data sets used essentially for this project include the USGS Jones Penetration Test database that I mentioned earlier, the USGS National Crustal Model. Uh, local geotechnical reports, as well as surface and groundwater elevations obtained by Silchman. I'll go into every one of these in detail in the next slides. So uh, the cone penetration database by USGS is a publicly available database that gives uh, CPT data for a variety of locations across the United States, and it has significant amount of data uh, in California and San Francisco Bay Area in particular. So this allowed us to get uh, CPT data for 21 points uh, within Alameda. Uh, surface elevation was obtained uh, from Silverstrom, which is a research consulting firm uh, based in the Bay Area, and uh, they primarily work in climate-related research. So we obtained uh, surface elevation and groundwater the table elevation from previous research that they have conducted. So the surface elevation is shown here, and uh, the groundwater table depth is shown. Depth to bedrock was determined using the National Crustal Model from USGS. The National Crustal Model is a, a project currently being developed and is still in the beta stages, but essentially what it allows you to get is a shear wave velocity profile uh, from the surface 
um, to the various depths. And so essentially we needed to define bedrock of any geologic formation having a shear wave velocity larger than 800 meters per second and use that to map uh, our estimation of the bedrock along the line. So essentially the methodology consisted of calculating shear wave velocity in ES30 in particular from our SCPTs, as well as identifying the different soil strata found on the island and the thickness of each individual layer from the SCPT data, but also from uh, the borehole reports that I mentioned. Those were then fed into stochastic models that use Krigging interpolation to get a probabilistic model uh, for the entire island. And all that information is then uh, put together to obtain a comprehensive soil model that describes both the soil stratigraphy and the soil stiffness. So the shear wave velocity, uh, or VS30 in particular, uh, in the top 30 meters were calculated from the SCPT data. And you can see here uh, that we found a large variation of VS30 across the island with much stiffer uh, soil found in the southeastern and central parts of the island, while you had uh, a lot um, softer soil in the northwestern parts with BS 30s in that area going uh, slightly below 140 in some areas, meters per second, that is. Okay, then we identified the soil, the, the soil layers and the layer, the layer thickness uh, using uh, the CPT uh, data. The CPT data was processed in CLIC, which is a CPT based liquefaction assessment software. Uh, and so that allowed us to get soil behavior type plots, which an example of is shown uh, right here on the right. So essentially what we did is try to ignore all those small layers and try and identify the larger uh, identifiable geological uh, layers that can be found in Alameda. And that was um, the, those SPT plots were used alongside the local geotechnical reports uh, most of the geotechnical reports describe boreholes with standard penetration tests, SPTs, and so that also gave descriptions of the soil types in those locations. And so essentially what we did after that is uh, create our probabilistic models that use uh, creating interpolation. Before feeding our um, data into the models, we applied beta transformations so that we could um, essentially add lower and upper bounds uh, to our predictions so uh, a good example of that is we didn't want any soil layer to be uh, soil layer thickness rather to be negative as that would be possible, right? Uh, and also we didn't want it to severely over predict a thickness that would not uh, be realistic in our opinion. So that allowed us to really constrain the prediction within a certain range. And then a radial basis function, uh, RBF kernel was used and the equation of data shown below. So now I'll go into the results we obtained. So essentially for the soil layer thickness uh, or for the soil stratigraphy, i rather say, uh, we identified uh, four main layers and uh, made probabilistic models for the top three layers. The first layer identified was an artificial fill layer that was mostly composed of uh, clean sand. And so um, a model of that clean sand layer is shown here. Uh, we noticed directly that the northwestern parts of the island had a large a thickness of fill, uh, while the central and southeastern parts had uh, far fewer, uh, that layer was less thick in those areas. And that uh, sort of aligns with our, um, what we expected to find for this island, seeing that in the 1900s, uh, much of this northwestern part and around the coastline, that is all, uh, that was all artificially filled, and the original part of the island, the central part, be found so that aligns with uh, those assumptions that we had about the island. A layer of Young Bay mud was found below that first fill layer, and uh, we can actually see that it's much more pronounced in that northwestern part, so along the area that was filled, um, and is far less present in the middle part, or central parts of the island. And then a merit sand uh, layer that is mostly composed of clean, dense to medium dense sand. And that is actually found in the original part of the island where uh, far less young bay mud is found. And then after that, uh, we decided to build a soil section that actually includes all those layers. And um, below those, uh, the layers I mentioned previously, we found 
that uh, there was a stiff clay layer that we identified as the Arab of Buena mud layer that is suspected to reach all the way to the bedrock. So essentially how we built this soil section is by uh, subtracting each soil layer thickness from the layers that were above it as well as from the, top, uh, from the surface elevation to get a complete description of uh, the soil stability. And that also goes to show us why we decided to uh, create the models for soil thicknesses uh, instead of soil depths, because soil depths would have given us overlaps in the expected depth. So this allowed us to get something that really coincides and works well together. And so some few, uh, a few things that I want to mention from this map, um, and you can see a section of that map in the top right corner to identify. So this shows the north western parts of the island, and this is the you know, central and south eastern parts. So a few interesting things we found is that much of that artificial soil layer that is found in the northwestern parts of the island is actually below the groundwater table, which raises uh, significant uh, concerns for the fact and seeing that that is loose clean sand right over there. Uh, and also, uh, we noticed uh, directly that this Young Bay mud is significant because it is its northwestern part. And since and Young Bay mud has consistently been uh, considered a uh, hazardous soil to be built over in the Bay Area given its soft uh, clay conditions. Also, another thing I want to bring your attention to in this section is that uh, the uncertainty from our models was able to be uh, significantly reduced for the uh, top portions uh, or top layers since uh, more data was uh, able to be collected for those layers, seeing that not all the data points that we had were able to reach uh, depths of 30 or 40 meters. Some, some of them significantly those from the borehole report were significantly shallow. And so you could only see the end of one layer or maybe two, but you could not see uh, all the way to the end of the one, for example. So you can see that the uncertainty for that artificial layer is the smallest. Then the young thing, mud layer is a bit larger, but that narrow sand layer that's kind of here, that's uh, the uncertainty of that gets significantly blown up because we have very little data at that layer. Another thing we proposed was a median BS30 map from the BS30s we calculated from the SCPGs. And so, and so the map essentially shows the same things that we saw from the individual points just all over the larger surfaces. So we saw that that northwestern part has a much lower BS30, ranging from the 100 to 150 meters per second, while that central and southeastern part has much larger BS30s, uh, all above uh, 200 or 250 meters per second. And uh, we suspect that that's very much in line with what we found from the soil section, given that we expect to find here that dense, the medium dense sand there that wouldn't make a fight given the fact that it's significantly dense, while um, that uh, the low BS 30s are suspected in that much western region, given the loose fill as well as the soft fill uh, below it. So what we were able to do after that is use a sediment velocity models or SVMs. So what that essentially is, is uh, models that allow you to obtain a BS profile, the field wave velocity profile uh, from the surface all the way to bedrock based on BS30, which is the field wave velocity in the top 30 meters. Uh, we compared several SVMs and also compared that to the outputs of the national Tesla model that we used for the bedrock. And uh, what we found was that the Shi and Asimaki model was the most similar to the, the most similar to the outputs of the MCM model. However, even here you can see that with the Shi and Asimaki SCM, using uh, both our mean prediction and uh, mean prediction with plus or minus two candy deviation, it was still consistently over predicting the shear wave velocity compared to the national cluster model. And so uh, further work must be done to know for certain what is closer to the ground truth. I know this is what we said. What we then looked at was the liquefaction potential indexes. Um, so well, we obtained LPIs uh, for the CPG sites using the same CELIC software that I mentioned previously. Essentially what the liquefaction potential indices are uh, is they're based on the liquefaction safety factor and um, they show the potential of liquefaction 
given a predicted earthquake and what the soil could handle itself. And so um, all the CPT locations were measured over all the LPIs for the different CPT locations correspond to the same um, earthquake. So this is, I think, model for a magnitude seven earthquake with a peak ground acceleration of 0.24 G. And so we really wanted to see rather than um, what would happen with different earthquakes, what would happen with the same earthquakes at the different sites across the island. So uh, for LPI value, the plot normally define uh, minor damage, while LPI values over 50 uh, define severe damage. We found that uh, four of our CPT locations will get very high LPIs that were over 50, as well as five other point state uh, LPIs that were in the range of five to 15. So uh, there was significant risk of the faction observed. And so we wanted to see where these were on the island. And so we plotted these out. And so you can see that that northwestern part that I mentioned earlier, where uh, which is fashion is suspected via the artificial field layer that was below the groundwater table, did indeed get uh, high LPI values. And so the defaction potential there was significantly elevated, um, uh, along with uh, the place on the southern side. So finally, some points of discussion uh, were that. Uh, severe risk of liquefaction and ground shaking uh, were suspected in uh, Northwest Alameda based on our results. Uh, and in addition, that soft Young Bay mud layer also raised concerns for cyclic recreation in that fine plane of material. Uh, I think that's important to note because much of that part of the island is still uh, uninhabited. So I think that the risk of ground shaking and liquefaction hazard or the seismic risk in particular needs to be um, heavily studied before uh, land development projects in that area as significant risk is suspected. Uh, as I said below, uncertainty was able to be reduced in those top layers. Uh, with over 100 oral reports that we had available at the beginning, only 22 were, uh, were able to be used. Some were disregarded given that uh, they had very shallow description that he didn't even show the end of the first layer. And some also gave uh, little to no new information for the models because they were very close to each other. Uh, while, the, while our model really describes our best understanding of the island given the data that we have, we definitely believe that more data points added will significantly improve the accuracy of the soil model. And finally, uh, we think that there's a lot of opportunities for future work to be done on this project. Uh, particularly because the kernel parameters we used for our creating interpolation were calibrated using engineering judgment. And that's somewhat due to the fact that we did not have sufficient data to, um, to or select those parameters based on um, more specific um, actual information that we have. And so uh, future work has the opportunity to develop a constrained optimization procedure for those stochastic models that would significantly reduce the amount of uh, subjective judgment and uh, improve and uh, give us more robust models essentially. So uh, while uh, um, preliminary predictions for uh, the seismic risk were offered during this uh, project, a full seismic site response analysis, such as an open seas analysis should be performed for the full regional risk assessment. And in conclusion, a high resolution probabilistics or model was developed for this project. It describes both the source geography and the source stiffness. Uh, we found high risk of liquefaction and ground shaking in the northwest and the coastline. Uh, and this project can, this uh, model can essentially be used to generate the input parameters uh, for a seismic site response analysis that would provide high fidelity surface ground shaking practices for regional risk assessment. Uh, I would just like to acknowledge uh, all the contributions of. Uh, my mentors. So first, I would like to thank Adam Zarinowski for being an incredible mentor, uh, Dr. Pedro Arduino for, uh, for serving as advisor, Professors Bet Maurer and Scott Brandenburg for the guidance they provided, as well as uh, Dr. Matthew Schaffer and Dr. Robin Nelson for serving as great um, mentors as well, and the NSF for funding this project. Now I'll open up to any questions and thank you all for being here. So Claire asked, can the methods used in the study be applied to other regions as well. So I definitely think that the method we used in this study uh, can serve as an excellent framework for developing similar soil models in other regions that could also be fed into seismic uh, risk assessment uh, projects. 
And um, definitely when dealing with uh, CPG data and local uh, borehole reports, as I think the, the framework we use in this project can be applied elsewhere very easily. Uh, I, I'm not sure. However, I do know that, uh, I mean, much of that is concentrated in the central parts and that there isn't much around the like newly built regions. Uh, I would have to get back to you about that. Yeah, so he asked if I knew the population density of Alameda, and uh, I wasn't sure. So. Thank you, guys. Good morning. Uh, my name is Gustavo Aguilar, a uh, civil engineering student at the University of Florida. Uh, spent the summer at the uh, Mary Lehigh facility uh, developing a next generation base isolation system for seismic hazard mitigations under Dr. Rickles and Dr. Sal. So to prevent catastrophic failure uh, what base isolation systems do is uh, decouple the structure from the ground and allow some matter of movement, uh, absorb and dissipate the energy of an earthquake. Uh, we were motivated to do more than that and just to prevent any damage from happening not just catastrophic damage, that way you can still use your building. Also, even if you do manage to do that, prevent any damage from happening, your building might still be offset from its original position, which um, will make it inaccessible and it could delay your business operations and become very costly. So our base isolation system is it uses a novel semi-active self-centering banded rotary friction device that has a semi-active control in response to near and far field earthquakes. And yes, and what it will do is just prevent damage, any damage, and also return your structure back to its original position. Okay, so studies show that friction base Friction type based isolation systems transmits less accelerations to your structure. And this bounded. Uh, this uh, banded rotary friction device here, BRFD for short, and is a cost effective semi active device that has a high uh, adaptive damping performance and making it ideal for far field and near field earthquakes. Um, this is uh, the rotary the drum here and the bands that tighten the drum, which cause friction and controls the damping force. Okay, so the setup has an uh, hydraulic actuator right here. And it reduces the displacements and measures the lateral forces. Then here we have two electric actuators that tighten the belts, which cause the friction control the damping forces. Also, the system is controlled by communication with uh, a, a pulsar servo test control, uh, which I didn't do much with that. Characterization test using a harmonic displacement uh, allowed us to construct this hysteresic plot here. And it demonstrated that the BRFD uh, with very little input uh, and attention force can uh, put out over a hundred times the amount of damping force that, and then it requires for the tension force in order to produce that damping force. Also from the same, this, Mr. Hysteresis plot, we were able to get uh, stiffness and force values that were used in uh, Python 3D to model the BRFD for numerical analysis. Um, just a little bit about this plot here. You, uh, it has this kind of concave up look, and it's because the, uh, the hydraulic actuator pushes laterally. But the drum kind of rotates uh, in a circular type motion. So you see this, this behavior here. Here's, uh, 
there's a video here. Maybe it'll let me play it. See if you have the emotion. It's louder. I don't, I don't hear the, but it's really, it's really loud. So. Okay. So during some of the tests, uh, electric actuator broke. So we moved on to numerical analysis. Uh, and and uh, I was able to model uh, some nonlinear single degree of freedom structure uh, using a high strength steel of about 100 KSI yield strength there. And uh, I created three of them uh, with different controls. One is a fixed base here that is just stiff to the ground. And then another one that has a BRFD uh, base isolated base. And then the third one has a self centering BRFD base isolated base. The self center mechanism, uh, also created in HICOM 3D, uh, uses an elastic no tension element, uh, elastic no compression element, and pure elastic elements. Uh, from the characterization tests earlier, uh, we took uh, the values to fit the test, uh, the data from the test into uh, a model of the BRFD. Uh, we modeled it as a bilinear um, elastoplastic uh, material. Here's some drawings of what is expected, uh, it's an exaggeration of what you can expect after an earthquake passes, how uh, uh, your fixed space would show a lot of displacement, maybe fail, some damage. And then the BRFD base would show no damage, but it will be offset. So maybe you won't be able to get in your facility. And then the self center BRFD would come back to its original position. Okay, so numerical analysis uh, uh, simulations of uh, all the models uh, was ran in MATLAB. And we use earthquake records from near and fault field, far field at uh, design basis earthquake scale factors, which it just means that the probability of an earthquake that magnitude to happen in 15 years, it's like 10%. Um, the data was uh, retrieved from UC Berkeley's peer database. So uh, let's see some of the results. After graphing the structural element, element deformation time history, you can see here in green that the model with the fixed base showed a lot of deformation. And compared to the two models, which are the straight line there, it was showed no damage at all. So that kind of proved that the uh, uh, BRFD base isolation system alone is good enough to prevent any damage from happening to the structure. If you graph the, the elements of hysteresis, hysteretic behavior, which is just uh, deformation versus the force here, uh, the nonlinear behavior here also shows that there was damage in the structure. And of course, this is the fixed space. Uh, the linear behavior of the hysteresis, they're both uh, BRFD or, or the self centering BRFD, uh, is another indication that you saw no damage in your building. And uh, some max deformation reduction here, which shows it to be pretty promising. It's in the high 90s percentile. But you would ask, like, what is the benefit of the self centering BRFD if the, uh, just the BRFD alone prevents damage? Well, if we graph the structural displacement uh, time history, you can see here that only the self-centering BRFD base isolated structure comes back to uh, zero displacement, which um, could allow you to resume business operation. Uh, there also showed some uh, max acceleration reductions, though I did expect better results than this. Uh, I think uh, that through some performing base design procedures that can be improved and uh, maybe turning on the semi-active mode of the BRFD could also help in getting better results 
against specific earthquakes since they're also different. Um, so plotting the isolators uh, is to reach hysteresis spot. Uh, you can see that the BRFD and the self-centered BRFD show a lot of energy dissipation, but the self-centering uh, can be seen as this uh, lag shape per se as it goes back to zero every time, which is what we were aiming to achieve and we have. Um, so in the interest of time, I will skip all the other earthquakes uh, results, but as far as future work, we recommend um, developing performance-based design procedures, uh, which uh, can also improve when you uh, use an ensemble of earthquakes, which is another recommendation, uh, while accounting for regular reactor uh, variability. Um, at this point, also, you can do uh, maybe uh, real time hybrid simulations between a uh, multi degree of freedom structure and the um, numerical model of the self centered mechanism uh, to show better results, maybe uh, what will happen in a more realistic application. Things like slippage and things like that. And in conclusion, uh, the BRFD works. Uh, it reduces the displacement drastically, and it has a high um, energy dissipation, which is, it, it prevents any damage from happening to the structure. The self centering BRFD, we also saw the results that it does bring your structure back to its original position which helps uh, keep utilities and uh, your doorways aligned and uh, you know, a good, your, your business can remain open after an earthquake. Uh, it's, uh, okay, uh, I'd like to say thanks to Dr. Rickles, the super chairman here, and Dr. Chow, and with their guidance, uh, this, I was able to get the results. Also, uh, thank you for uh, Dr. Nelson for appreciating this whole RU summer program. Thanks to the National Science Foundation and Mary Eco for funding the program for us as well. Some reference that uh, you can take a look later. I recommend this last one here. And, uh, Open for questions if you have any. Okay, so uh, um, explain a little more about why the models didn't perform as well. Yes, why didn't the acceleration, max acceleration reduction, show better results uh, <laughs> with the with our base isolation system? And uh, I think it has to do with uh, just how I use it in passive mode, but the BRFD has a semi-active mode. And also every earthquake is different, and so it's going to behave differently. But with uh, the semi-active control, it would adapt to it and just uh, changes damping force per se. And uh, you'll get some better results. Any other questions? Anybody in the Zoom? Yeah. Yes, sir. So the question um, was, how did the electric actuator break? So during the characterization tests, we lost control of the electric actuator. Some blame that there was a power um, outage overnight. Uh, some say that something was changed without no one seeing it, and, but we lost control of it and it ramped up the, the, the load on it. And just uh, it stopped working pretty much. It ripped it out of its uh, uh, rod. And we didn't have a backup, so. We had to change the project to just pure numerical analysis. Anybody else? All right. Well, thank you. All right. So, with 40% of the nation's population living along coastal communities, a large portion of our population is subjected to climate driven disasters. Um, and then especially one hurricane season can demonstrate the staggering toll that these events can have on those areas. 
And so it is very urgent for us to minimize those losses and those threats through the usage of building codes or other mitigation techniques. Building codes specifically are meant to be the primary mechanism for defending our coastal built communities. However, we don't know how valid these things are because we don't have validated in-person experiments. Um, and studies suggest that the latest model building codes can be very effective, but it is very important that we can experiment and validate these practices, especially because natural hazard events provide a valuable opportunity to have a live laboratory setting for having these climate driven hazard events being tested. All right. So, like I said, design level events are the best way to validate our codes and dramatically understand our building codes and how those things work and securing our safety and our functionality of our infrastructure. In 2020, Hurricane Laura hit Lake Charles area and it was a category four storm and it provided an opportunity to have that live laboratory setting. Um, the data that was used and implemented from Hurricane Laura was collected by a whole bunch of different data collection agencies, such as STEER, the Structural Emergent Extreme Events Reconnaissance Network, which gathered over 500 miles of street view imagery. Okay, the validation of these codes require a whole bunch of different data sets to be plugged in together and fused into creating one data inventory. So we generated this information by using the NARI Sim Center and the different building inventories that they gathered for over 30,000 different homes in the Lake Charles area. And then we identified which of these single family homes had also been assessed by STEER in Hurricane Laura. And all of these were fused together with the wind speeds taken from the applied research associates. And this was made into an inventory of 420 plus homes for further analysis. And then we saw that the vulnerability to hurricanes is driven by a number of attributes of the home and the hazard. Um, and these were identified through FEMA's hazards baseline, which is what STEER uses to identified damage ratings. And so we use the attributes that were located by FEMA's hazards to determine what we should be looking for whenever we're looking at these homes. And so these include terrain surrounding the home, which is taken from land use land cover data. And then we also looked at high wind zones and windborne creek regions. And then we also looked at these specific attributes such as the secondary water resistance on the roof, as well as the roof cover, um, the size and the spacing of the deck attachments, um, the use of shutters on the home, and then the presence and the quality of an attached garage. And all of these attributes were assigned by a rule set that I created to see how they correlate with different codes and force at the time of construction. Okay, and then now we're kind of looking at how the codes evolved in the state of Louisiana and we split it into three main eras. And so we are looking at the different high intensity hurricanes that hit the Southwest region of Louisiana. And the first arrow we have defined as pre-2006 when there was no statewide building code and all of the things that we found, all the attributes were mapped out dependent on human-based data or other different attributes that were not statewide in force. The second era is after 2006, whenever we did adopt the statewide building code. And we can notice that in this era from 2006 to 2018, in 2017, the governor rolled back the latest code additions to adopt prior codes. Um, and then in 2018, we adopted what we have the contemporary building codes in Louisiana, and we have the 2015 international residential code. And you can see in all the previous eras, we have different eras of those building codes, but the 2015 one is the one that we use even today. Okay. 
So this slide specifically summarizes the damage rated by Steel and Hurricane Laura by code eras. And we see the three code errors that I just described earlier. Um, and so these are FEMA has this is damage ratings and from lighter to darker, we see more severe damage ratings. Before the statewide building code, we can see that less than 40% of homes have minor to no damage. And it is very impactful that the storm had, the impact that the storm had was very detrimental. As opposed to after whenever the codes were implemented, we saw that over 80% of the homes had minor to no damage. And the enforcement of the latest IRC in the third code era, which included increasing the design wind speed by about 20%, um, resulted in a very similar performance. So from this limited sample, we can see that the statewide adoption of building codes was very useful in almost having the percentage of homes experiencing moderate or higher damage. Okay. And now if we look at the results by specific attributes, we can look at these plots as they display on the y-axis percentage of damage. And on the x-axis, we see vulnerability attributes increasing. And so the size of the circles or like the density of the circles is also indicated. So you can see whenever there's more homes having this particular attribute. And so in the first figure, we're looking at the roof structure as we see the roof to wall connections. Um, and pre-2006, we saw that we used toenailing to connect the wall to the roof. And then after 2006, we saw the mandating of straps which you can see at the origin of the graph caused almost no damage as opposed to the toenailing. Um, whenever we implemented those, you could see damage ratings as high as 85%. And then on the right side, we see the role of the roof deck attachment, which I talked about earlier, which is the size and the spacing of the nails to attach the roof um, to the rest of the home. And we look at how the sheathing is attached and we see that a lot during the y-axis. We saw that the damage rating can be increasing by a very high amount. And then on the x-axis, the nail spacing is very important as opposed to the nail sizing. We see that it's not as impactful whenever we're increasing. One of the most important attributes that we saw was the role of the shutters. So post 2006, we see that shutters or a certain kind of window thickness is mandated by code. And we can see that with the blue dots, which is the shutters observed, I mean, the shutters predicted that there is some kind of a disconnect with the damage ratings being relatively high. If all four of the shutter sizes are shutters are applied on every side of the home. And we can see that that disconnect happens because shutters have to be implemented by humans before the hurricane makes landfall. And therefore we have a human behavior aspect to it. And we see that in actuality with the observed red dots, these hurricane shutters were not being implemented. And as soon as two to three sides of the homes were shuttered, we can see that the window damage is no longer a factor. And window damage can cause to like pressurization in the household that can lead to like structural failure. Oops. So in conclusion, we can see that the usage of building codes whenever it's applied is very important. And more than, houses are more than twice as likely to survive Hurricane Laura with minor to no damage whenever it is implemented. However, we see the difference between the code errors not being that much. And then we also see that therefore codes do work. However, whenever we delve into the attributes driving performance, we can see that straps and things like roof to wall connections and RDA are very important. However, there are a lot of factors identified by hazards that were non-factors. And that's such things such as the attached garages, which were very important in that first house diagram I showed, but in Lake Charles region, only about 30% of homes actually had attached garages. So it was not as important as we thought it would be. 
And then finally, with the shutters, we saw that the critical aligning of engineering guidance, policy, and human behavior is necessary because when we don't implement the codes that we have, it can lead to very detrimental damages. In terms of future research, we hope to extend the damage assessments in the STEER data set so that every single code era has a more substantive amount of research being done on. And then we can conduct multivariate analyses segmented by code eras to examine how those different attributes might play into each other because single-handedly they might not be that effective, but together they can be very detrimental or they might not be that correlated. And then we can examine a larger cross-section of components and material features so that things that weren't identified by FEMA's as is can also be taken into account because they might be important or not important, such as we saw with the attached garages. And finally, we can use these findings to make suggestions for future code amendments and then also how we have apply all of these things since we know that human behavior is also important. And then finally, I would just like to thank NSF for funding everything, as well as thank my mentors and my research partner, Neva, for all the continued support on this project. And these are my references. Does anybody have any questions? All right, so I think I'll go ahead and start. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Tyler Rodriguez, and my research from the Near Ely High Experimental Facility is on the investigation of semi-active controlled friction dampers for seismic hazard mitigation. Oh, oh it doesn't, oh, okay. Sure. Now it does. <laughs> Use uh, the up and down. Up and down. Okay. Um, anyway, so the motivation behind my research is to answer the question um, how can structural engineers redu reduce vibrations in buildings due to natural hazards? Well, research has shown that one way to do that is by uh, implementing these mechanical devices called dampers into buildings. And at the Atlas Center at Lehigh, we specifically focus on the unique banded rotary friction damper or BRFD. Who's, uh, whose setup is shown in uh, figure one right here. And um, as you can see, it's made up of a frame uh, as well as a drum that's connected to a hydraulic actuator, um, as well as a flexible brake band that is wrapped around that drum. And this band is also connected to these um, electric actuators. And, um, and these actuators basically act as controllers that help to control the uh, dynamics of the damper. And basically how it works is that the electric actuators attached um, to the band can control the um, tension force in the band um, by, uh, by tightening it. And, uh, and uh, when a building is vibrating or moving, um, that is going to rotate the drum, which is what the hydraulic actuator helps to uh, simulate. And uh, as the drum is uh, rotating and moving and the band is being tightened and being rubbed against the drum, this creates a very powerful friction force. Um, and this friction force is what's used to combat the applied forces, i.e. the vibration of the building. Uh, and dampers typically have three modes, passive, active, and semi-active. Um, in passive mode, uh, just the damper on its own is um, connected to the building. Um, in active mode, the damper is connected to the building um, with the electric actuators and the electric actuators uh, match the force that the uh, damper feels from the, from the uh, vibrations of the building. And in semi-active mode, uh, the, the actuators uh, help to control the temporal force in the band constantly uh, during, the vibration, during the vibrations of the building uh, in order to get it to an optimal um, energy dissipation level. And, and my research uh, aims to find out which of, the, which of these three modes is the BRFD best suited for to, um, to mitigate any seismic vibrations. And this is all done by way of numerical simulation in MATLAB. So since I'm modeling a friction damper, the first thing I need to know is how to model friction. 
And the friction model chosen for this research was the Lugre model. And this was chosen apart from other, other uh, friction models based on the fact that it has better computation time in MATLAB. Uh, it captures the stick slip behavior and stride back effect that the um, BRFD often experiences. And, and, it, and the fact that it has relatively fewer parameters, namely these six listed here. And the Lugre model is uh, basically made up of equations um, one through three. And how it works is that it takes in the velocity V of the damper and solves the, different, the differential equation of the intermediate variable Z shown in equation one here, um, and outputs the friction force F uh, needed to uh, mitigate the vibration uh, as seen in equation two. And one of the things that makes the Lugre model convenient to use is that three of the six parameters, namely FC, uh, FS, and VS, or V back, uh, can be estimated from experimental data. And exactly how that's done is shown in uh, figure three um, by using the force and velocity graph of, of the experimental data. So now that we have these three um, parameters estimated, we're, we're only left with sigma zero, sigma one, and sigma two. And to figure out what um, those, uh, those three unknown parameters are, uh, we need to fit this Lugre model to um, the experimental data. And the experimental data used for this fitting um, was obtained by inputting a harmonic displacement time history into the hydraulic actuator, as shown in figure four here. Um, and the electric actuators um, adjusted the tension force in the band to uh, three different levels, namely 50, 60, and 70 pounds. And all of this resulted in three different data sets shown in figure five by way of what's known as the hysteresis curve on the um, force versus displacement graph. And so it was these three curves that the Lugre model was uh, fitted to by way of the uh, particle swarm algorithm uh, in MATLAB which minimize the root mean squared um, error between the model and the uh, data. And after, after optimizing the computation time down to around less than a minute, um, I was able to obtain um, values for the uh, last three parameters. And the results of the uh, fitting are shown uh, here. So figures uh, six, eight, and 10 uh, show the model fitting uh, to the uh, three different hysteresis curves uh, with a uh, blue being shown uh, by the um, experimental data and red being the um, numerical model. And uh, as you can see, the, the model fits the experimental data uh, pretty well. And figures uh, seven, nine, and 11 show the model being fit to the uh, force time history. And uh, once again, we see that the model fits the data uh, pretty well. So now that we have a completed uh, friction model, the next step would be figuring out how to um, design the controllers for the BRFD, uh, namely how do we model the electric actuators. And once again, these actuators are only used in active and semi-active mode. And the model chosen for these uh, controllers was the linear quadratic regulator or LQR algorithm in MATLAB. And this algorithm is mostly used to uh, describe systems whose uh, dynamics can be expressed with reduced complexity by the state space formulation uh, in equation six, where uh, x is the displacement and velocity vector, u is the force vector, and a and b contain the mass and stiffness matrices. <laughs> and basically how the, this algorithm works is that it takes in uh, user-defined parameters q and r, uh, and outputs a matrix K as shown in equation four, uh, such that um, equation five is minimized. And one of the things that makes LQR convenient to use is that, um, a, is that uh, a damper needs to minimize the displacement and uh, velocity. So, and since Q and R are user defined and uh, we want to minimize X here, um, we can do that uh, by just setting R to a very small value. Uh, because if we do that, that will force X to be very small since the entirety of equation five has to be very small. So for, um, so for all of the simulations I used, um, R takes on a very, very small value. 
And after verifying the friction model with the um, LQR and the LQR controller with a simple single degree of freedom system, I then moved on to uh, simulating them on a three degree of three degree of freedom system, uh, as shown in Figure Twelve, which is a three story building with uh, dampers on each floor. And uh, the excitations used um, for these simulations were the six earthquakes um, listed here. Um, all taken from the peer database of UC Berkeley, uh, and three of them being uh, near field, meaning they were measured less than 50 kilometers from the epicenter, and three of them being uh, far field, meaning they were measured at least 50 kilometers from the epicenter. And uh, simulations were run uh, for these uh, earthquake input files with the design basis scale factor. Uh, which, which means that we're modeling an earthquake that has a 10% chance of occurring in, uh, in 50 years. And separate simulations were run with the uh, maximum credible uh, scale factors listed there, which means that we're uh, modeling an earthquake that has a 2% chance of occurring in 50 years, um, unless it has more extreme values. And for all the simulations, the displacement and acceleration for each floor was reported. And consistently, the extreme values for displacement were on the first floor, and the extreme values for acceleration were on the uh, third floor. So those are the results that are shown here uh, for the uh, maximum credible earthquakes, with uh, the left side showing the uh, far field earthquakes, the right side showing the near field earthquakes, and on each side, the left column shows the acceleration response on the third floor and the right side showing the displacement response on the uh, first floor. And, uh, and uh, in black is shown the um, uncontrolled structural response of the building, which is uh, how the building will react without dampers. Uh, blue shows the structural response uh, with the dampers in passive mode, and red shows the dampers uh, in semi-active mode. And uh, just by looking at everything visually, we can clearly see that uh, semi-active mode uh, best mitigates the vibrations across all earthquakes near and far field uh, for both acceleration and displacement. And these results can also be shown numerically in table two, which shows the um, percentage reductions uh, for displacement and acceleration from the uh, uncontrolled case for, uh, uh, for all the earthquakes. And just by looking at the uh, far field averages and the near field averages, uh, we can clearly see that semi-active mode uh, reduces displacement and acceleration uh, from the uncontrolled case, uncontrolled case much better than uh, passive mode can. And, uh, and we can also see that uh, semi-active can reduce accelerations um, a lot more. So, so what all these results tell us is that Clearly, semi-active mode uh, can best shows the best uh, performance for mitigating vibrations um, in a small building, and this can mostly be uh, accredited to the fact that the LQR controller uh, can be tuned, uh, namely the Q and R parameters, uh, can be changed so that we can get the most optimal results. And uh, and as I said, another trend is that uh, semi-active um, also uh, reduces um, acceleration a lot more. Uh, which is great news for the people and the equipment living inside those buildings since they have to deal with uh, much less motion. Um, these results also show that, um, that the BRFD in semi-active mode has great potential for even further verification, um, which can be done by testing it on taller buildings. Uh, it can also be simulated with uh, non-linear buildings since the building that I simulated it on was um, linear. Um, and the excitations can be expanded to uh, multi-hazard uh, simulations. So not just earthquakes, but also uh, wind loads, since they can also induce um, vibrations in a building. And um, all of this is more than enough, uh, more than enough reason for the uh, BRFD in semi-active mode uh, to be tested with the specialty of the Atlas Center, which is real-time hybrid simulation. Uh, and real-time hybrid simulation uh, involves both physical involves both the physical and the cyber components of the damper, the actuators, the models, and uh, parts of a building. And, uh, and it runs uh, simulations on all these components simultaneously 
in order to get more accurate results um, of the structural response in real time. So very exciting research um, is to be continued at the Atlas Center um, after my research. Um, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Dr. Leanne Cow and Dr. Jim Rickles, as well as uh, Thomas Marullo from the Atlas Center, uh, Dr. Nelson from Miri, and the National Science, Foundation, National Science Foundation for their support in my research. Uh, thank you so much for your attention, and I'm now open to any questions. I don't think I can see the chat. Tyler, everyone in here says you get a gold star for working around the technical difficulties and not losing your cool. Good job. <laughs> Thank you, Robin. All right. Well, uh, thank you again so much for your attention. All right, hi, my name is Krishna Tay, and I'm an undergraduate research intern at the UT Austin Neary site uh, for the Mobile Shakers, and our research project is examining the effects of porosity on the soil water retention curve. Um, so to begin very broadly, uh, soil most commonly exists in unsaturated state. So this is a state where a portion of the space between soil grains is occupied uh, completely by, or not completely, but just with water. Um, and the main thing about this state to know is that it hasn't really been researched very well, and we don't really have a lot of uh, knowledge um, in the space. And so often in geotechnical uh, analysis, it's assumed that the soil at a site is either fully saturated, meaning that all the soil grains are uh, submerged in water, or that the soil is completely dry, meaning that there's no water in the sample or very little of it. And so this is um, done as a conservative estimate because this is, these are the uh, weakest uh, states of soil. So uh, definitely uh, a conservative estimate, but still it's very uh, inaccurate to assume that. And so definitely an understanding of the unsaturated state of soil I could go a long way in structural engineering, um, agriculture, and geotechnical engineering, uh, but especially in our understanding of landslides. So that brings us to this image right here. Uh, this was taken uh, earlier this year in January, it's a trip of Iowa. And what had happened was that a big wind was in California, and the aftermath of that was this landslide. What likely happened here was that the soil uh, absorbed its precipitation, it was gradually more saturated until eventually it uh, collapsed. And so uh, research into this um, is very important in understanding that uh, state of going from stable to unstable. And so that's just one of the significances of um, our field. And so this research has begun uh, recently in the past couple of decades through mainly numerical means uh, because the interactions are so complicated in the unsaturated state uh, that uh, it takes a lot of computational power, which we now have. And while experimental methods have been used, these methods tend to be uh, very expensive and time consuming. So the main difference to know about unsaturated soils and uh, saturated soils for us is that there's the uh, kind of force that we experience in both. So unsaturated soils, because soil grains are completely submerged in water, um, it, they experience a buoyancy force. That's the dominant force there. And so that actually acts to lessen the shear stress. And because shear stress is directly proportional to the soil strength, that, um, that weakens the soil. Whereas in unsaturated soils, because the water level is so uh, little, um, the water usually takes the form of these liquid bridges um, in parts of the soil uh, that make it so that the, uh, the, the suction force from the water tension is the dominant force. So that increases the shear stress and that's the soil strength. And so, uh, where the soil water retention curve comes in is through uh, looking at uh, the different liquid states of uh, the soil samples. So uh, to explain these, the capillary state is uh, when all uh, water, or sorry, all soil grains are submerged in water um, and 
all the liquid clusters have combined into one liquid cluster, and you can think of that as like a continuous uh, bubble of water. Um, and then the pendular state is kind of the opposite, where there's very little water in the sample, and the water that is there tends to be on these liquid bridges. So uh, that's why the suction value is so high there. And then in between is this nuclear state, which is a mix between the two, where simultaneously you have uh, uh, liquid clusters and these liquid bridges. And so the soil water retention curve has to communicate when this happens and how uh, strong the soil might be at this uh, point. And so a little bit of background into unsaturated soils. So Messine was able to relate the void ratio to um, suction. Um, so that's a very foundational piece of uh, evidence, or that's a very important relationship that is the foundation of uh, something that we're doing. Um, and then Lee et al. earlier this year, or the, the article was published this year, was studying the effects of product of geometry on the outcome of the soil water retention curve. And what he found was that at some particle geometries, there are more or less efficient uh, packing densities. So the implication there is that the empty space between soil grains could, have, uh, could be a driving factor in the outcome of this curve. And then Joe et al. and Matt Wynn et al. did a different thing where they created or improved upon previous uh, numerical predictive models for the soil water retention curve. Um, and so they do this by comparing and calibrating their models uh, with uh, experimental test data from actual uh, empirical lab tests. And so it'll be interesting to uh, compare the trends that they found with some kind of uh, our research that we uh, did. And so getting a little bit more specific into what we were doing, um, what we're really getting at is that what saturation is such high because again, suction is related to the source. And so uh, research into the actual behavior of unsaturated soils is again, not a very, uh, very well developed. And so there have been a couple uh, couple people before us who have uh, done something similar to what we're doing. And so Rich but all used a two-dimensional simulation um, and basically tried to discern uh, the soil water retention curve among other data. And then later on building off of this, the same with all uh, actually my mentor uh, was uh, expanded upon this and used a three-dimensional uh, uh, model uh, to uh, try and get a better uh, data set. And so the main difference between uh, those and what we're doing is we're simulating at a much higher uh, resolution, about eight times what we're seeing it all was doing. And with that, we're hoping that we get more detail or some other information that the other uh, studies might have missed. And so how do these simulations even work? So they operate off the of last Wolfson method. And the last Wolfson method basically discretizes 2D and 3D space into a lattice. Uh, so at different lattice nodes, you can measure data and what we use specific, specifically the discretized particle distribution function, which outputs density at a certain uh, 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 lattice point. And the thing about the lattice Wolfson method is that uh, because everything is discretized, they rely on what's called these velocity sets. Where, which is basically just a defined set of velocity directions that you can use that uh, can uh, define or can describe how liquid moves throughout the model. And so and that's just the way that the, the thing works out. So what we use is the DT velocity set, um, which is like that thing very roughly. And uh, we use it because it's relatively small for three dimensions. Um, but it's still acceptably accurate for our purposes. And so the main reason that it's, so, uh, that it's used so often is because it's computationally efficient. And the reason that it is, the very underlying reason about that is the, it's simulating the aggregate particle behavior of a fluid. And so we're not really concerned with one-on-one -on -one, uh, liquid particle interactions. We're really concerned with the aggregate behavior of the fluid and its, behavior, and its uh, influence on suction values in our soil samples. And I think, uh, Oh, I guess I haven't mentioned this, but the LVM has different models. And so specifically, we're using the same time model because it's um, more computationally efficient than other LVM models. And albeit it is a little bit less accurate, but again, the kind of accuracy that we're looking for is not going to be super impacted by this uh, fact. And so how do we even incorporate the last question method into our simulation? Well, we use a code that was developed by researchers at the University of Texas that contained the necessary a, uh, mathematical equation from the model. And the way that it works out is that we take the code, we initialize it on the parameters, and uh, 
then the link node will input a file or import a file uh, containing uh, oil grain sizes and position. And it's arranged in such a way that we find that we uh, find our correct velocity. And so that's the main thing that we do. And then after that, the simulation runs. Uh, we don't touch it for 48 hours. And then uh, while it's doing that, it processes these two files that contain a three dimensional um, like representation of what's going on in the simulation at the time or at a time point. And then it also adds to the set file, which uh, contains numerical data that we then use Python 3 and give it an output to graph the, the SWRC and so on. And just analyze the data. And so, before I get into the results, I just want to go over a little bit about what's physically going on in the simulation. So, as you can see at the beginning, we started at very low level of saturation and incrementally we get water into the sample and get saturated. Um, and so, the reason that we do this is because uh, that's the way that I guess the really interesting reason, but um, it's, I guess it's simpler that way. And also, uh, the uh, recordings of data that are made happen at different times. So what I mean by that is that the system that's injected with water is fluidly deliberates and then it takes a We do that in one of the weeks our final cycle. Um, and so this is just one of our simulations that we uh, used. So now getting into what we actually found, so these are the soil water concentrations that are generated. And I guess right off the bat, it's, it's very much what we expected to see. So the lower processes have much higher suction value for different saturation in general. Uh, that uh, um, that implies that they're stronger, which is what we see in reality. Um, the same thing that we said about lower rocks at high suction value, where the um, where for the in a given saturation is actually lower. Than and so, uh, what we also find is that the uh, lower processes have a much more gradual particulate state, and high proxy samples have a much more gradual state for that. And so, that's also in line with what we would have expected. And if you know, from the and all that, we would all have found a very similar phenomenon with the natural predictive models, where uh, lower density is very good to that species. And then, uh, two things I have to mention. Uh, there, it looks like some of the MPC, particularly R, which is a high velocity simulation, but high saturation. The model being more unstable instead of half state that the other data is off. It's just that in that region, uh, it's good. But here you can see uh, models. And then getting into a more exciting bit, I guess, um, I'm comparing the soil water to the cluster order, which is the average number of soil and the cluster number of good cluster. Um, what we use the cluster order for really is really determining when a capillary state was hit. Uh, and again, the capillary state is when uh, soil, are, soil grains are submerged and the liquid clusters are combined into one big liquid cluster. And so the literature tells us that the, uh, that the capillary state should, have, should be reached once the uh, expulsion value has been reached, and that's the point at which low or small decreases in suction would result in large decreases in suction. I mean, large, sorry, uh, small increases in saturation. Lead to large decreases in suction. So that's where it does begin to have uh, possibility. And so, what we find in our uh, lower classes for the in addition to me is that the capital state is reached way before that happens. And then in classes of 0.4, that it happens after that state. Um, after that uh, value has been reached. And so, there's definitely something interesting you know, that it doesn't actually really show what the literature says. And it's something that will need uh, further research in the future. Um, and that basically concludes what I found this summer. Um, before I go, I want to uh, acknowledge my mentors, uh, Rahana Hosseini and Dr. Patricia Creighton for providing valuable knowledge and resources. I also want to 
from Closet Tech, from the University of Texas for providing the necessary computational resources. Uh, I want to thank the MIRI NCO and especially Dr. Robin Nelson and Dr. Karina Gilma for organizing the RU program and the research program. And uh, finally, I want to acknowledge the National Science Foundation for funding this uh, experience in this project. Um, and if you're at all interested in any of the literature uh, in this presentation and resources, uh, thank you for listening and let me know if you have any questions. Uh, it's usually saturated, so at a certain point, um, oh yeah. Oh. Uh, so she asked um, if it was the saturated state that um, landslides occur, and the answer would be more or less yes. Uh, because there's a certain point where the soil strength um, lessens to a point that uh, the soil can't support itself and eventually fails. So that takes kind of everything that was on top of it down. Thank you guys for listening. All right. Hi, everybody. My name is Chelsea Wilhite. I am pretty excited to share this research with you. I've been doing nothing but this for the last three months, so I can't wait to get it out of my head. I'm going to be talking to you about estimating wave reflection using the orbital velocity method. Uh, and uh, my home university is Portland State, and I studied at Oregon State University over the summer. Yeah. Ready? There we go. All right. So we know from experience that hurricanes and tsunami waves cause massive amounts of damage and destruction. Tidal waves alone cause millions of dollars worth of damage to coastal communities every year. So understanding and being able to model these waves is really a key part of being able to research and design solutions to this kind of infrastructure. Um, as waves move inland from deep ocean, one of the important interactions that it has with its new surroundings is reflection. Um, you can see in this bottom picture here, a wave reflecting off of the side of a parking building. Um, reflection occurs when it a uh, wave hits a boundary of change density. So this could be the slope of a beach as it comes inland. This could be any type of building such as homes or businesses. Um, we can measure and model these types of waves in the lab using various instruments. Um, but usually when we measure those kinds of waves, it's the combined incident and reflected waves. And it's sometimes necessary to be able to isolate either the incident wave or the reflection of a specific surface over time. So, so um, classical methods of estimation for those kind of waves, like the Mansard and Fuch method or the Buda method, those use um, co-located wave gauges that are perpendicularly spaced throughout the research setting. These measure elevation to calculate reflection. However, however one of the issues with this method is that uh, they require a completely flat surface beneath the gauges and uh, that the allowable distance between them changes with every parameter change. So if you change the wave amplitude or the period or anything, you would have to reset a lot of these gauges or in some cases have to partially drain your facility, which is really time consuming and sort of a waste of resources. The orbital velocity method, on the other hand, um, proposes using a singular wave gauge to model these reflections. Um, one of uh, the ways that it models reflections is by looking at the orbital motion of water beneath a wave. And what you can do is when a wave reflects off of a surface, the two waves then become distinct from each other. And as they recombine, 
it creates this elliptical pattern that you see in the center here. And that velocity gauge, which we also call ADV, acoustic Doppler velocity meters, can measure the um, velocities in each direction. And then we can recreate that ellipse there. Um, uh, this method has been done by other researchers in um, numerical models. So they've been able to do it pretty successfully and be able to estimate reflection and the uh, amplitude of these waves, but it has never been done with physical models or any obtained data. Um, so to apply this method to a physical model, which is what I did for most of the summer, I was able to collect data from two separate experiments and uh, both of these experiments were for the purpose of wave dampening for near shore protection. So the first project that I looked at was the Emerald Tutu project. Um, this team was studying interconnected floating pods made from geosynthetic material and simulated plant life. So the yellow stuff that you see on top there would be simulated grass or natural fibers of some kind. And then the green stuff on the bottom would be um, like any kind of barnacles or algae or seaweed or anything that grows off of there. And uh, we set up a series of these acoustic Doppler velocimeters or ADVs um, behind the front of the pods and then in front of the pods along with wave gauges and pressure gauges. And uh, we were able to um, test three different configurations with these pods. Um, one of them was the baseline, which had no pods in it whatsoever, one sparse configuration, which is what you see running in the video here, and then one dense configuration where all the pods are really compacted and close together. Um, for each configuration, multiple trials were ran with varying initial conditions, up to 50 centimeters in the wave amplitude and up to six seconds for the period. And all of the instruments were set to record every hundredth of a second. All right, the second project that I was able to take data from was the mangrove project. Um, similar to the Emerald Tutu project, they were also doing wave dampening, but instead of interconnected pods, they were using simulated tree root systems of mangrove trees. And they did this using arranged PVC. And instead of in a large wave basin, they did this in the um, large wave flume. Um, same thing here, there was a set of ADVs that were set up before and after the configurations. Um, unlike the pods, though, these were done with six different kinds of configurations. So they had a low density mangrove system, a high density mangrove system, and then the baseline with no mangroves. But then they also had a seawall that was placed behind the mangroves as well. So for each of these configurations, a minimum of four separate depths, depths were tested at a maximum of 270 centimeters in depth. And then from each of those depths, we had multiple trials with different wave types, different amplitudes, different periods, um, a maximum amplitude of 110 centimeters and a maximum period of 7.7 .7 seconds. And then again, all the instruments were set to record 100th of a second. There we go. So once all this data was compiled, um, specific trials were selected for further analysis. Um, as I mentioned kind of before, this method, the orbital velocity method, is based off of something called linear wave theory. Linear wave theory is a set of governing equations for regular linear waves. So any waves that were tested in the basin that were not um, linear waves, so anything that was irregular or error function, so tsunami waves, we couldn't use the orbital velocity method on. So these trials were immediately thrown out. From there, we um, kind of pruned down the trials to ones that had roughly linear, regular um, aspects based on the period and the amplitude. And then um, from there, from the trials that we had left, we inputted one singular wave gauge data and one singular ADV data into Excel. Um, and the position data was then graphed. The position data is going to be this graph up here in the right-hand corner. And what that does for us is we can visually see where the ADV is um, registering purely incident waves, a combined reflected and incident wave, and then purely reflected waves. And from there, we can pick a single wave cycle, which is the length of one period um, from each of those and test it and be able to apply that for that whole time segment. Um, from there, we took the, the velocity data from the ADV for those specific time segments, and we graphed the horizontal and vertical velocity simultaneously, which is what you see down here on the bottom graph. These are the three time segments for one of those trials. 
Um, so for each trial, I was able to estimate roughly the wave height of the incident wave, the reflection coefficient, and then the phase of the resulting ellipse by manually adjusting these values and then having my linear wave theory equations pre-programmed in a separate file and having Excel iteratively solve this for me. And so it's all done by hand. So the results as a whole were really successful. I, I tested 21 trials all in all. These are the ones that I was able to estimate the data for. Um, the, what we're looking at here is the estimated wave height on the left-hand side, which is what orbital velocity method is getting, and then the targeted wave height, which is what we told the wave machine to make for us. So um, from the mangrove, we picked uh, two configurations. The baseline, which had a depth of 1.45 meters, and then the low density, which had a depth of 1.45 meters. And then we also did those same trials with the wall and without the wall so that we could compare. Um, from the Emerald 2.2 tests, we picked just the one trial, and it was the sparse configuration with a depth of 1.36 meters. And then on the side here, you can see the range of reflection for each of these cases. And despite having wildly varied initial conditions and a really large differences in the range of reflection, the results actually provided a high level of confidence in the orbital velocity method to estimate these parameters. Um, so much so that it's pretty much on par with previous methods of estimation using the spatially separated wave gauges. So these are the four trials where I was unable to estimate any of the parameters. Um, uh, what we saw when we graphed the velocity for these was instead of this nice, like elliptically shaped velocity plot for these four cases, we were actually getting something that looked like the toddler had a crayon and just kind of went wild on the graph. So we weren't able to apply a best fit ellipse to any of this. So why is that? Well, if you notice for these four cases, three of them have the same wave height and the same period. Um, we actually expected for those three out of the four that it would probably be pretty difficult to estimate these parameters. So this here is going to be um, a graph of the limitations of various wave theories. Um, this is the point that I was just talking about with those three separate cases. And then this is my limit for linear wave theory or orbital velocity method. And you can tell that it's way outside of the limits that we had originally suggested. It also, by theoretical approximations, this wave shouldn't exist because it also surpasses our braking limit. So it's possible that it was also braking and causing all kinds of turbulence is why we were getting weird values. This may also explain why we have such large differences in some of the individual values that we were able to predict because they're a little bit outside of the theory and thus we get a little bit larger range in uh, data. Okay. So finally, we have our most interesting outlier, which is this guy here. That's the fourth one that didn't have the same wave height or amplitude as the other ones, despite being well within the limits of linear wave theory. Um, this could be due to faulty data. I know at one point there was a piece of paper that was floating around the flume and just causing havoc with all of our instruments at one point. But it's also possible that this is actually a more interesting interaction between the waves and the mangroves. Um, it could be that the waves, as they're moving past the mangroves, it's causing vortex shedding and breaking. And then this is purely turbulent. So it would show up on a velocity graph, kind of like that one that we saw where it's just kind of chaotic and impossible to predict. Um, the only way to know for sure really is to do a more in-depth experiment on this specific trial with that same setup multiple times, which we didn't really have time to do in the scope of this project. All right, so in summary, the orbital uh, velocity method was able to successfully estimate um, the trials for most linear and regular cases. Um, the convenience of this method is that um, it is very easy to place within the wave basin. You can put it where space is limited. It doesn't need to have a flat surface beneath it. And you don't have to use three or four gauges placed in different places. It's just the one gauge at the one spot is really nice. Um, this research is a great step towards expanding this method for regular waves. 
Um, we want to find uh, eventually a semiotic separation method for incident and reflected waves. Um, an automated procedure would allow us to estimate that whole time series for each of those regular combined and reflected sections instead of just one singular trial or period within those. And finally, um, in its current form, the orbital velocity method isn't able to do any estimation for irregular waves, but it could be expanded to irregular waves by means of a Fourier transform. Um, we could estimate the reflection waves from each of the harmonic components of the velocity data. And then this would allow researchers to develop um, a spectral analysis for each of those parameters for the entire time sequence. All right, there we go. All right, so uh, first I would like to say thank you to Dr. Pedro Lamonaco at Oregon State University for his time that he sacrificed to be my mentor and for his guidance and for not kicking me out of his office when I asked the same question multiple times in a row. Um, to thank you to Dr. Um, Robin Nelson at UT UTSA for the editing, the organization, and for being willing to uh, Zoom chat with me at a moment's notice when I kind of panicked about my presentation. Uh, thank you to the Emerald Tutu team that allowed me to get hands-on experience with uh, creating the pods for their research program. Um, to my fellow REU students, Alexis Slipovich and Carter Howe for their company while in the lab and for all of the stories that they told me that are still funny today. Um, and to my friends and family with for being okay with not seeing me for the last couple months while I was working on this project and uh, for letting me explain and complain my research about my research over and over again and not disowning me afterwards. All right. Um, oh, and this research was funded by the National Science Foundation. So thank you for that. These are my references. And can I answer any questions? Mm -hmm. um, we can look at the time that it takes for a wave to reach the ADB. So if you notice, there was that section at the beginning of the, oh, for those that didn't hear the question, um, she asked uh, how I know which segments of those that position data is the incident wave, the combined wave, and the reflection wave. Um, we can look at that time seg segment and see kind of how long it takes for the ADB to start measuring waves because there's that whole section at the beginning where it's not measuring anything but like a little bit of noise. And so it's about at 5,000 seconds or 5,000 hundredths of a second or something like that. Um, and then we can say, okay, so it took that long. And then we notice at the wave and then 5,000 from there, we'd be like, okay, this is about the same distance from the wave machine as it is to the wall. So this is when the wave will reflect because we can kind of assume that it's gonna take, because it's the same period wave over and over again, that it's gonna take the same amount of time to cover the same amount of distance all the way across. And we can use that to figure out when it's reflecting, when it's combining, when wave generation has stopped. So when the wave maker stops making any waves and it's just whatever is still reflecting back in that direction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, you're good. So um, the question is asking um, about where we chose to put the velocity gauges in both of the experiments and why we chose to place them there. Is that right? Uh, so both of these projects were done for other purposes. So their purpose was for measuring um, wave dampening to see how much the velocity and the energy changed across the pods. But we can kind of use any of the positions as long as we know, because we have a big, huge spreadsheet of where each of the instruments is placed. We're like, okay, it's near the beach at this X, Y, and Z coordinate system, which is near 
this surface and we can kind of get an idea of what it's going to reflect off of. If I was going to choose where I could put these ADVs, I would put them within a very specific distance of surfaces that I knew it was going to reflect off of. So the wall, for example, in case of the mangroves, if I knew it was so many inches or so many feet from there, I could pretty clearly see where it was reflecting. Um, the data that I picked um, was from an ADV and a wave gauge that was before the mangroves. So that the incident wave that I was measuring was totally unaffected by the mangroves. It didn't become a problem until it went through the mangrove system and then it would be affected by the reflected wave, which is why I also checked the baseline case to make sure that I was still getting consistently what I was supposed to for the incident reflected combined wave. Yeah. Any other questions? Huh? Oh. So how does these how do these kinds of measurements inform energy extraction from waves? Um, I know there are a couple experiments going on right now at the wave basin or wave energy exactly, but um, my specific project didn't look at wave energy. I was only looking at how can I estimate reflection using this specific method and is this easier or harder or more accurate or less accurate than the way we've currently been doing it. But there are plenty of research projects going on right now about wave energy conversions, including ones about reflection. That just wasn't particularly my project. All right, anybody else? All right, thank you so much. Hello everyone, my name is Jesse Hernandez Gonzalez. I'm currently an undergraduate student at University of Puerto Rico, Mayagüez. During this virtual summer program, my project consisted on the contribution to cold form steel seismic design within the cold form steel energy project. My mentors during the summer program was Amanpreet Sin and Dr. Tara Hutchison at UCSD Large High Performance Outdoor Shake Table. What's that? <laughs> what is cold foam steel? Cold foam steel members are formed are made from steel sheet materials formed into different kinds of sections. By roll forming the steel through a series of dies. Cold foam steel does not require any heat treatment, unlike hot roll steel, hence the name cold foam steel. This construction material offers many advantages. It's a non-combustible material, making it resistant to fire spread and corrosion. It's a lightweight material, making it easy to ship, handle, and assemble. It also has a high strength to rate ratio, making it ideal for structural members. Cold form steel framing shows promising resource for a new constructional material due to its physical properties. Its high durability and ductility makes it ideal for high seismic zones. A little bit of background information on the literature that has been conducted on cold form steel Cold foam steel walls have come in use orange at a strand board as the shading material. There's very limited literature on the use of steel sheet sheeting on shear walls. Drew tried to expand it on this by testing different thicknesses of the steel sheet. There's also very limited research on one line assemblies. The research has mainly focused on isolating the shear wall. The building code also limits cold foam steel frame buildings to 65 feet and the need to test taller mid-rise buildings. My contributions within the cold foam steel energy project is to improve the understanding of cold foam steel wide lung be structural behavior under seismic loads by a series of quasi-static tests. I will also be working on video processing on, of the experimental program conducted at UCSD. In here, I will be looking at the local and global damages of the specimen that keep performing state levels. I will be also building a 3D geometrical model that will be used in the future to construct the 10 story building at UCSD. Also, I will be doing a simplified finite element model of the mid rise cold foam steel frame building to better understand the structural behavior on the seismic loads. The cold foam steel energy project consisted of several experimental programs. They first tested the connections of the building. 
as well as the diaphragms. My contribution is into the experimental program of wall line tests. In here, they tested 10 different wall configurations, like wall openings, uh, finishes on the wall, different tied down systems, as well as <clears throat> asymmetrical shear walls. The culmination of the Cold Foam Steel Energy Project will consist of a complete architectural 10 story building. This is a first of its kind cold foam steel frame building. It says 103 feet tall and the, lim and the cold limits it to only 16 feet tall. I want to expand a little bit on the experimental program of the, of, of the part that I'm contributing to. Here in the inline wall experimental program, the, they tested the wall specimen connected to two HSS members. The bottom HSS member served as anchoring to the strong floor. The top HSS member helped, uh, the, helped the hydraulic actuator transfer the lateral load via the hydraulic actuator, my bad. The hydraulic actuator had a load capacity of 49.5 kips and 23.5 and inch stroke. The top mass consisted of the concrete slab plus the HSS member, which sums up to 850 pounds per linear foot gravity wall. At the right, we can see a figure of the displacement control query protocol that the wall was subjected to. As I, brief, I will briefly explain it, you can observe here in the initial cycles that are very small, therefore the wall specimen is not receiving any real displacement. However, as the, of the, of the, query, of the query protocol progresses, the cycles become bigger, therefore the displacements become bigger too. This behavior will continue and to 60% post peak degradation of the, of the wall specimen occurs. To explain why we chose this two specimen out of the 10 specimen tested, it was because this two specimen, we can actually observe all the damages occurring at key performance state levels. Uh, and the other specimen, we cannot observe it because we had finishes and therefore we cannot observe every single damage occurring on the steel sheet and the studs. The main difference between these two specimens is the tied down system. In the last picture, we can see the SDGS 1HD specimen. Basically, the, the system consisted of hold down system as the tied down system. Here, we can see in the picture where the hold downs are located. In the right picture, we can see the SDGS 2 specimen. Basically, this one consisted of two tension tie rods at the end of the shear walls. Here we can have, we can observe a video of the SDGS2 specimen being tested at UCSD. At the left, we can observe the actual test occurring. At the right, we can see the force displacement curve data. And at the bottom, we can see the force that the tight tension tie rods are experiencing. In the picture, in the video, we can observe screws happening at the corners, screws getting damaged. Also, we can observe buckling in the steel sheet and now we can observe that almost every screws in the corner in the studs are getting damaged. There's almost any fastener connected to it. This table was used because the, the, this target performance levels, this target performance level of the specimen was, the specimen damage at this target performance levels was used to, to, to test the, the damage assessment. This level was based on the backbone curve of the specimens. I use this table to identify the time instances corresponding to the performance level at each specimen. In the elastic and quasi-elastic region in the specimen, it behaved linearly and essentially linearly. Therefore, there was no apparent damage to, to report and or to see. In the quasi-elastic region, there were some damages occurring in the and the steel sheet here, some lines were forming. And the design performance level, which is at the peak of, of this force displacement curve, we can see some sheet tearing occurring at the edges. We also, we also can observe some shear buckling occurring in the steel sheet as well as some pull through of the fasteners. In the above design performance level, we can observe here in the force displacement curve that the specimen is losing strength. Also, the damages at this performance level were some pull through of the screws, uh, also on screw in the middle fasteners, as well as extensive shear buckling at the steel sheet. We can observe a complete, at the end of the test, we can observe a complete pull through of the sheet 
We can also serve some bottom track damages and we can also serve buckling in the studs. This is the other video of the SDGS 1HD specimen being tested. It's not. At the left, we can observe the actual test occurring. At the right, we can see the force displacement curve data. And at the bottom, we can see the, 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 the force that the hold downs are experiencing. Again, we can see in the steel sheet of the specimen, a plastic deformation occurring. Also, the, the screws are, there's almost any screws connected to the studs again here, the, almost at the end of the test. In the elastic and quasi-elastic region and this specimen, the, the specimen was behaving linearly and essentially linear again, therefore very small damages occurring in the specimen. At the design performance level, we can observe shear buckling occurring in the steel sheet. We also observe some sheets here in here in the corner and some screw damages here in the top corner. In the above design performance level, we can observe sheet tearing here in these two sheets, some unscrew in the middle fasteners, as well as some extensive shear buckling here. At the end of the test, we can observe, a, again, a complete sheet pullover of the sheeting of the specimen. We also can observe some damages in the, in the bottom track, a buckling in the stud and the hold down getting damaged. So basically, this is my other contribution to the Code from Steel Energy project, which consisted of building a, a detailed 3D geometrical model of the 10-story building. In this first picture, we can see how the actual building is going to look as we have the glass mats and the shoreboards here with the wall openings. In here, I zoomed in a snapshot of the 10-story building of the first three floor, so we can actually observe how it's going to look and how the structural members are going to look. Here I have a, a snapshot of the first floor of the 10 story building. I put this in color so we can actually observe all the different structural members the, the 10 story building is going to have. In red, we can observe the, the frame members in the wall openings. In yellow, we can observe the studs. We can also observe some track and uh, the top of the wall. In pink, we can observe some buckling, we have all blue, the track members serving as the ledgers. We also have the joists here, some bridging here as well. And on the right, we can see again, how it's going to look when it is constructed. So this basically is in here, this is the slice of the arch type building model. So this is what we are constructing at UCSD, this part. This slice is going to be modeled as well in SAP 2000. This is still ongoing work. So basically, in the we divided the the shear walls in different colors. So we're gonna condense these three shear walls into one shear wall, and these three shear wall, three she, three blue shear walls into two shear walls. These shear walls are going to be modeled as springs, and the floors and the roof of the of the building is gonna be modeled as, as a rigid diaphragm. So to sum up the, the specimen with, whole, with tension tie rods experienced considerably less low, had less uh, lateral strength and lower stiffness as compared to the specimen with hold downs. As you can see here in these two pictures where the lateral force was and where the lateral force in this and with the specimen with the with the tension tie rods. Also, the, the hold downs experience larger axle force. This is due because the, the connection was a more rigid connection to the, to the bottom HSS member than the tension tie rod. So I wanted to acknowledge my graduate mentor, Aman Sin and Dr. Tara Hutchison for guiding me throughout this summer program. I also wanted to thank Dr. Robin Nelson for helping me throughout the summer and the NSF program for funding this program. This is all my reference list where I took all the information to conduct the research and present this PowerPoint and any questions.
Well, the well, she asked how in the, the videos were obviously real quick and she asked how, how and when we start to see the damage in the specimen for really the test was like a whole day long. So it was really slow at each, as you can see, let me show you, I cannot. So basically here in the screw protocol, so the test was stopped at this level and the test was stopped at this. So to see the structural damages occurring and then it continues. So they stop at every key point. So they stop and continue, stop and continue. So the test, this test took a, a entire day. questions so thank you for listening then. uh hello everybody my name is kaylee mattingly i am a third year civil engineering student at the university of washington and i'm going to be telling you about my project the suitability of panoramic photographs for developing structure from motion models so structure from motion or SFM models are created for pre and post disaster data. So you can go take pictures of a disaster site either um, in preparation for a potential hazard or after a hazard has occurred. Um, and you can actually use these photos, put them into a software, which is the process called structure from motion photogrammetry that turns these photos into models. And this can be done for um, examining uh, damage or uh, for planning purposes. And this is typically done with uh, unmanned aerial vehicles or drones. So usually it's drone um, camera footage that is used to create these models, um, but this is not always feasible. Drones are very expensive and there are also a lot of limitations on flying drones. You have to know someone who um, knows how to fly a drone and can get approved to fly them. So that's not a very accessible mode of data collection for everybody. Um, but, would, but what could potentially be more accessible is using panoramic photos. If you put a spherical camera on top of a vehicle, like they do in Google Street View, or um, even mount it on top of a backpack, um, you can take spherical 360 degree panoramic photos of a site. Um, and so my question for my project was, can I develop a workflow that um, can use panoramic photos to make structure for motion models of, of infrastructure? Uh, and then could this potentially be an accessible um, alternative for using drone footage? So a little background about SFM photogrammetry. So this is essentially you're piecing together multiple viewpoints. If you have a camera that is moving and taking images at um, a particular spacing, um, you can put these images through a, a program on the computer that will um, identify key points among these images. Um, you have to upload um, GPS information along with like in regards to where each photo was taken. Um, and then the software can actually identify key points that are common amongst the pictures and piece them together into some three-dimensional models. Um, now, a lot of times you can actually use multiple types of data sets to create models. Um, for example, one of my colleagues earlier, Tyler, did a presentation about combining uh, LIDAR data with panoramic street view data to create um, structure for motion models. So a lot of times different types of data can be combined. But I want to see what can only be produced with panoramic images because drones and laser scanners are expensive and require a lot of expertise. So the instrumentation I use for this project, so there's a lot of software and hardware. The software I used um, was Pix4D Mapper. This is the program that does structure for motion photogrammetry. I uploaded all my photos to this program um, and did all the processing. So I spent a lot of time in this program. Um, I also use Immersive Studio, which is NC Tech's um, official software for processing their photos um, when I actually collected my own data. Um, as you can see in the picture in figure five on the right side of the screen, that is a picture of me wearing a very tall backpack with a camera, um, the NC Tech camera mounted onto my back. I walked a lap around a building on campus at University of Washington and collected images myself, and then I processed them in Immersive Studio um, before processing them in Pix4D Mapper. Um, Hardware-wise, the data sets I used work with two different camera systems. I used some images 
that were taken with the Applied Street View camera system and with the NC Tech camera system. These are the two spherical camera systems that are offered at Rapid University of Washington. So the images that I used in order to develop this workflow, I had three different collections of images. The first was 300 images at the University of Washington campus uh, taken two years ago by Harriet Wright um, with the Applied Street View system. And she was actually an REU in this same program. Um, and then I also worked with a collection of over 3000 images of the city of Westport, Washington taken by um, one of the rapid faculty, Jacqueline Peltier with the NC Tech. And these images were taken as part of a, a tsunami planning project because the city of Westport is um, a high risk tsunami. So that's why all these images were taken. So I got to use this data. Um, and then finally, I wanted to collect some of my own data um, to try with my workflow. So I took 700 images of the hub building at UW um, with the NC Tech on my backpack. And just to give you an idea of what my data looks like, this right here is one of the photos that I took, one of 706 photos that I took um, of the hub at the University of Washington. All right, so this was a very exploratory project, um, but I was basically working with a lot of different settings within PIX40 Mapper to try to find what works best for um, plugging panoramic photos into this program to produce models. So PIX40 Mapper basically performs three different uh, main processing steps, um, but I focused on the first two, initial processing and point cloud and mesh processing, um, because these are really what creates the models. Um, so there are a lot of settings within each of these uh, processing options. Um, as you can see, I have an interface posted on the right side of my slide that kind of shows what it looks like within the program um, and what, how you use, uh, set up different options for processing. So with all these settings, I had to change, basically to isolate the effect of all these settings on my model, I would change them individually and then rerun these processing steps in a very long and tedious process. Um, and, and then I also took a look at how I can edit and optimize the point cloud to make it easiest to view and easiest to potentially use. So before I begin my results, I just want to say that they are highly qualitative and they rely a lot on screenshots from Pix4D Mapper, which I will be showing you lots of. Um, it's a very exploratory project. So um, the results of changing one setting really led, um, it kind of set forth the direction of, of where my project is going to continue to go. Um, and the observa observations I made from this project pertain to using panoramic photos from Applied Street View and NC Tech. Um, they don't necessarily apply to other camera systems because these are the two that I got to work with at Rapid. Um, and these apply, these settings only apply to panoramic photos. So in Pix4D Mapper, first you have to decide on a processing template um, before you upload all the images. The processing, processing templates you can pick from are 3D model or 3D maps. Um, on the left, you can see this is where I use the 3D map template and the uh, blue and red dots show where basically where the street view car was driving and where all the images were taken. And as you can see, um, the cameras were not even remotely accurately placed. All of those little rectangular pictures you can see kind of in the middle with all of the green rays pointing out um, that is not even close to what we want. That's not going to produce a viable model. So using 3D maps, if you're trying to make a 3D map um, with panoramic photos, it is likely not going to work. Um, however, using the 3D model template, if you look at my screenshot on the right hand side of the slide, you can see that you can see where each individual photo was taken along the route that was being driven and almost every photo was calibrated correctly. Um, so then within the first two processing steps, you can actually select a different image size and what this does is the, the program pix 4 mapper. Um, will look at the photos compare them and identify key points and. If you make the image size larger then the, the program says that you're essentially zooming in on the photos so that when um, the program is identifying these key points, they could potentially be more specific, more accurate. Um, so the program gives you the half image size is the default option for step one processing. Um, and I also tried increasing it to full image size. And what I found out that even though you might think um, increasing the image size might make a more full and more accurate point cloud, um, sticking with the default option of only half the image size, it took half as long to process and uh, there are actually significantly more uh, matches in key points per calibrated image. And so my point cloud on the bottom half of the screen is um, the half image size default option, which actually looks a little bit more dense than the top option. Um, I also tried one eighth image size, which is the smallest option. And um, as you can see, it looks like a dust on a computer screen. It is not really viable for making any models. Um, 
it, it, it just does not work out. Um, and then additionally, I tried working with one fourth image size and double image size, and both of these actually failed because sometimes processing fails within Pix4D Mapper, and um, the program does not give you a whole lot of information about why it fails. Sometimes it just does not work. So then finally in image step two, I got to work with the same setting where you can adjust the size of the images. So I looked at both half image size, which is the default option again, and increasing the image size. So here we can see these are actually taken from the data that I collected myself. Um, the top image is a pretty nice looking point cloud of, of this building. Um, it processed in only 17 minutes and, um, and it's a bit noisy around the edges, but there aren't a lot of extra points that need to be getting rid of. Um, on the bottom, I used full image size for the processing option. This took exponentially longer at two and a half hours of processing. Um, and you see a lot of these kind of grayish, brownish points, both along the bottom of the building and some along the top um, that are completely unnecessary. They are noise. They do not add anything to the model. Um, and I think that they are probably a result of um, when you have the, in each panoramic photo, there's a little bit of the camera equipment or the backpack or the vehicle that you can see kind of along the bottom of the photo. So I think that the program tried to process uh, these little bits of, of equipment. Also in step two, you can choose how dense you want your point cloud to be. Um, to create, basically create kind of a more filled in point cloud. Um, this takes a lot of time to process if you increase the density. Um, the default option is to use medium point cloud density, which you'll see on the top. Um, and it only take, it took less than half an hour for me to process this. And then uh, processing the same data set, exact same photos with high density took over five hours. And it definitely produced a significantly fuller um, and more detailed point cloud. But again, as we saw with increasing image size, there is a little bit of extra noise happening. So there's a trade-off there. Now, finally, to kind of clean up these models, um, I worked with two different techniques of editing these models, um, disabling points and carving. So um, manual point disabling is when you look at a point cloud and you actually get to use this polygon selection tool within Pix4D Mapper to select the points and you just delete them, you disable them. Um, so on the bottom left of the screen, this is um, a point cloud from uh, the Applied Street View data set that I used. And this is just um, immediately after step two, nothing else has been done to this cloud. It looks like an explosion of blue and gray on the bottom. Um, there's really not a lot of information there. And it's because it captures the sky and the ground in all these photos. Um, so after, and now we see on the right, um, this is the exact same point cloud, the exact same thing. Um, after I manually deleted the majority of those blue and gray extra points. Um, and so that's a really great way to very quickly remove all of those extra points. And then with carving images, there's an annotation tool called Carve, where you, um, on the left, you can see the annotation interface. You can draw over your image um, with this red pigment and basically choose any part of the image that you want to crop out. Um, it deletes these points entirely, and there's no forgiveness. So if you accidentally um, carve over part of a building, it will not show up in your model anymore. And so now this is the same point cloud um, but I carved the sky out of some images and it's looking even cleaner. So, and now to kind of discuss my results and, and going forward, um, for step one and two processing, using default settings is reliable for panoramic images. Um, and step one, increasing the image size really does little, has little effect on the subsequent point cloud and really only adds processing time. Um, and in step two, increasing image size is also unnecessary. Um, increasing point cloud density definitely creates a fuller looking point cloud, but it does add a lot of processing time. So this may not be appropriate for everybody's project. And then with uh, carving and disabling points, I recommend that you manually delete excess points and then carve um, images. Like if you're getting rid of the sky, you can carve that out um, after manually deleting as many points as you can. Um, and then I'd say that for every 100 panoramic images, if you carve the sky out of one to three images, this will remove the majority of the sky points in your point cloud. Looking ahead, I think that this technology um, is absolutely usable for measuring buildings. As long as you're using, creating an accurate point cloud, you can actually measure um, structures within the uh, program fix 4 mapper. Um, this is best for, I think, areas with few vegetation because I've discovered that um, the more vegetation there is in your photos, um, the noisier your models are going to turn out. Um, I think that this could potentially be used for post-hazard damage assessment. Um, and I think going forward, a great direction to go with this is to find um, a way that we can automatically detect the sky in these panoramic photos in the program so that 
um, we are not spending a lot of time having to manually get rid of all the sky points in these models. Uh, my research was funded by the NSF and um, and I also wanted to give some special thanks to my NERI mentor, uh, Robin Nelson, um, all the faculty at RAPID who supported me through my project and helped me learn a lot. And then also my fellow REU students at RAPID for um, moral support and being becoming great friends and uh, being able to talk about my project together. Um, and here are references to the images I used in my slide. And um, thank you so much. And I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Any questions? What was the research that was done previously? Can you repeat that question? Yeah, sorry, but what did the research look like previously? Uh, do you mean the similar project that was done before mine? Yeah, that's right. Okay, yeah, so that project by Harriet Wright two years ago, her project was looking at, I believe, um, combining um, some street view, or I think she was doing structure from motion models with, um, with I believe, LIDAR and um, taking photos, or I believe it was UAV vehicles and, um, and street view. And so she was basically combining multiple data sets together to try to produce um, a model. She wrote a really helpful little um, guide about how you can combine street view and, and UAV images in pix 4 mapper to create point clouds. Uh, and so I kind of, my project was a little bit of a continuation of that, but um, essentially just looking at panoramic photos. Um, but because she had already published, she had taken 300 images, um, using a street view camera. And then she published those on, um, those were available on a rapid Google Drive. So I was able to actually utilize that data um, that she had previously used. Cool, thank you. <laughs>